All right, guys, we are back and we are at Peter Atia's place. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. It's uh, obviously a very unique and interesting opportunity to be here. I'm a huge fan of your stuff, been for years, been a part of, uh, had a membership on the drive, learned so much from it. And um, just wanted to say first and foremost, appreciate everything you do, all the content you put out. It's super informative, educational, and entertaining for nerds like me. So oh, that, that means a lot. Thank you for your support and uh, the feelings mutual. So I was thrilled when you reached out and asked if I wanted to get a early copy of Outlive, which is your new book and very much appreciate that. And what went into the motivation behind this initially? I mean, I think it changed a lot over time. I mean, at the outset, um, you know, when I started writing that book was, I think, 2016. So this was even two years before I started podcasting. And at that time, all I was doing was blogging. So I think it was kind of a more comprehensive way to put thoughts together. And it started out, I think I allude to this a little bit in the book, it kind of started out of an email I got from a friend who asked a question that, you know, probably could have had a one sentence answer and it became a 2000 word email yeah. that turned into a 10,000 word manifesto that eventually turned into the first draft of that book, which was entirely discarded. Um, and, and if I'm going to be truthful, I, I honestly, I think part of it's inertia. Like I think once you sort of start something like that, you, you want to sort of see it through. And there were moments certainly throughout the process when I didn't feel like seeing it through. <laughs> no, I can I can imagine what goes into something like that because it's so comprehensive and rigorous to represent everything you've learned essentially in a summarized format without getting too granular, but also being, you know, covering all the basis when it comes to what you call the four horsemen of death, which we're going to talk about soon, which I think is a great name, by the way, and very catchy and viral, and I think will you know, get the attention of the right people to take it seriously. But before we get a bit more granular on stuff, I did want to ask just, I'm sure a lot of people watching are probably familiar with you and your material and what you're about, but could you just give like a high level synopsis of who is Peter Atia? Well, uh, I'm a physician and I, um, I practice you know, what I describe in the book as medicine 3.0. So it's, uh, it's, you know, really a type of ultra, ultra, very, very early personalized and preventative um, medicine. So the goal is how do you manipulate nutrition, exercise, sleep, emotional health, pharmacology, endocrinology, all these things. How do you manipulate all of those things to reach a better lifespan, i.e. live longer, and um, perhaps more importantly, exact a better health span, so quality of life. and I would say that that's, that's kind of my, my main focus is, is how do I do, how do I do that for my patients? How do I do that for myself? Um, and then around that, everything I do is sort of based on that. So you mentioned a podcast and, you know, write a book and we've created a lot of other types of content, but it's really all in that spirit. And was there a pivotal turning point in your career where you kind of stemmed into like preventative medicine as a like complete focus where this is your niche that you're going to drill into a lot harder? Yeah. I mean, I think that transition happened. Well, I guess by way of background, I should mention one other detail. So one doesn't train in this type of medicine, right? Like it's not like after medical school, you say, I'm going to go do my residency in prevention. Yeah. Um, and it's possible there's something today that maybe mirrors that. But certainly when, when I graduated from medical school nearly 25 years ago, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went into surgery and the reason for that is I really enjoyed surgery. And in particular, I was, you know, attracted to cancer surgery and, you know, was kind of going down a very traditional path in that, in that regard. But then I left medicine. So I, I really had kind of a, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but just kind of a midlife crisis before I got to midlife. And I was like, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. I don't feel like I'm making any difference. Um, and you know, my wife gave me great advice. She was like, look, I think you should either change the system that you're so unhappy with or get out of the system. But I think to stay in the system, i.e. to continue to practice medicine and be as unhappy as you are is a recipe for a life of misery. And, you know, at the time in my early thirties, I was like, 
Yeah, she's totally right. So, you know, I just left actually. I don't think she expected that. I think she assumed I'd like stick around and figure out a way to fix it, which of course I had no clue how to do. So I left medicine and I actually had kind of a, oh gosh, like six year sabbatical for medicine. Um, and then through my own interest in this for my own health, became, you know, obsessed enough to really dig into this stuff. And that's what then brought me into the rediscovery of a practice of medicine. Was there any motivation or people who paved the way sort of, cause I'm not really, from what I've seen, you have some of the longest standing content on this type of field. And I don't know if there was people that paved the way before that or anything of that sort. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I, what I had is a lot of mentors along the way. So, mm -hmm. you know, part of it was my own personal interest in, for example, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. One of the horsemen we'll talk about and the most prevalent of the horsemen and the one that seems to be most fixated in my family. So it was the one that I most wanted to understand how to prevent first. Mm -hmm. And so 15 years ago is really when that journey began. And um, it accelerated when I met a guy by the name of Tom Dayspring in 2011. Um, and Tom became and remains to this day a remarkable teacher of mine, a mentor of mine. Ta Tom now works with me. So he's Tom is in our practice at the time. He was in private practice and also as a and worked as a lipid educator. Mm -hmm. uh, he then went on to work at a lipid lab as their chief technical officer before I ultimately got him to come and join us five years ago in our practice. And, um, you know, that's but one example of basically what I did, which was, um, if, if I have one talent in life, it's being able to spot really smart people and learning as much as possible from them. Like I, mm -hmm. I really do have, uh, I, I think a, a supernatural talent for figuring out who's smart and figuring out like how to learn and get to 60% of their knowledge. Mm. Um, and so that was effectively what I would spend the next decade doing is figuring out who the smartest people were in oncology and nutrition and cancer screening and lipids and endocrine and this, that, and the other thing. And, and basically just, again, the beauty of it is these people are all insanely generous with their, um, with their time and with their, with their knowledge. I've never really encountered an exceptional person in this regard who, who wasn't completely willing to, to kind of teach. No, that's awesome. I have to ask before we get granular on, you know, the horsemen, the cardiovascular disease stuff that you mentioned, acronyms in your Instagram bio. I feel like a lot of people have no idea what these mean. So you are an MD focused on the science of longevity. So, so MD is medical doctor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you're obsessed with JMA, OMA, RFA, AVA, archery, racing car, Senna, DFW, Ligers, and you're trying to not be a... Can you say this word fast? Ultra. Ultra crepidarian. <laughs> okay. So I don't even know. If, do I have to name those off or do you, you remember them all? Yeah. Uh, okay. So JMA, let's start with. That's my wife. Okay. So are these the initials for your my children? Kids, yeah. Okay. And then, so I guess that covers the first four, yep. presumably. Yep. And then we have uh, DFW. David Foster Wallace. Okay. And who is he? Uh, he, was a, he was an author. Right. Okay. Ligers. Uh, is, have uh, you seen Napoleon Dynamite? Yeah, a long time ago. All right. So you'll recall Napoleon draws <laughs> ligers. Right. And right. I, I really, I love ligers. In fact, when we finish this, I'll show you a picture I drew of my wife in okay. the spirit of Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, right on. I'm a big fan. Is that, one, is that your favorite movie? Um, I think it's a movie that occupies a very special place in my heart. When I was in my fifth year of residency, um, I think that's when that movie came out and me and another guy who was uh, a guy named Bob Montgomery, who was the head of tr the transplant division at Johns Hopkins. He was equally obsessed with the movie. <laughs> so Bob and I were so obsessed with this. And there was a month when I was the, uh, resident on transplant. So you had a fellow and then a junior resident and then, you know, interns and stuff. So, um, Basically, that month worked out such that Bob and I were doing kidney transplants the whole month. And some of those are scheduled, but a lot of times they're not. Obviously, cadaveric kidneys come in and you have to do... Anyway, there was this one really bizarre period of three days 
when Bob and I did 13, I believe it was 13, maybe 15 kidney transplants in three days, not leaving the hospital for three days, you know, barely getting any sleep in between. And for the entire time we were in the OR for whatever number of hours that three days amounted to, obviously you're not in the OR the whole time, we listened to the Napoleon Dynamite soundtrack on repeat the entire time. How many songs are there? Well, you know, there's probably like a dozen songs and then another 20 clips from the movie oh, where you okay. just have like, you know, Pedro and Napoleon talking or something like that. And, you know, um, nursing is a very specialized thing in the OR. So you're always working with the same group of nurses as well. They're on a mm -hmm. shift and they're rotating, but there were very transplant specific nurses. So by the end of this three days, I mean, they were ready to kill us. <laughs> they were imagine. so <laughs> annoyed yeah. with this, but we just took it to new highs. Yeah. And he even went on, I remember a year later, I'd already left medicine. He had a Napoleon Dynamite party at his house. And I flew back at the time I lived in San Francisco. I flew back to Baltimore for the weekend just to go to the Napoleon Dynamite party. Huh. And that gets how seriously we took it. What happened to that actor? Is he still, has he done John it? Heater? No, he's still, uh, yeah, he's still kicking it. Okay. So the other uh, thing, ultra crep crepidarian. Yeah, so ultra crepidarianism, or one who is an ultra crepidarian, which I try not to be. It's a, it's a, but it takes a lot of work not to be. This is a person who basically speaks with authority about something that they know nothing about. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of ultra crepidarians running around. Oh, for sure. And I, I do my best to not be one. But the implication of that is you have to say I don't know to a lot of mm -hmm. questions. No, understood. So you had a, a longer one, at least seemingly, that had, let's see, uh, RPF, Secretariat, Self, EXP, EXP, CGM, Continuous Glucose Monitoring, presumably, mTOR, uh, PI3K, AMPK Autophagy. So RPF. Richard P. Feynman. Okay. Right behind you there. Mm. Um, self EXP. What is that? Self experimentation. Oh, okay. Senna, your favorite driver. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, yeah, I think I know the rest of these. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. What happened to the watches? Uh, still obsessed or no? I yeah, I I I, <laughs> I I'd, I'd still be obsessed with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's your favorite one? Or do you have one? Um. What's my favorite watch? That's a tough question. Um, I I would say uh, just as a general rule of watches, and this is a topic that watch nerds would discuss endlessly. Mm. Like the if you could only have one watch discussion, yeah. Um, it's a very difficult toss up between a Daytona and a Speedmaster. I think would be your would be your toss up watches. Okay. Some might argue a no date sub could be thrown in there. Um, but, but I think for me, it would be a toss up between, um, a Speedmaster pro. And of course, within the speedy pros, you've got lots to choose from and of course, which Daytona, but you know, so you're not using one that tracks, you know, crazy bio like metrics or anything. It's just a watch watch. Yes. Yes. No, I'm very, very analog in my love of watches and I despise smart watches. I, you, I don't know how much one would have to pay me to wear one. Yeah, it wasn't uh, just like 10 minutes ago. You were just completely shitting on Apple. So I can't imagine your opinion of them. Um, okay, Four Horsemen of Death. Um, I guess uh, defining what these are first is probably the best place to start because these are kind of like the classifying these into subcategories is the most easy way to, I think, digest what is the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, so I think... Um the idea of thinking about these diseases a lot is, is I think, an entirely obvious one. I don't think there's any earth-shattering insight that comes in, that comes from the realization that if you want to think about longevity and you understand that part of longevity is lifespan, mm -hmm. i.e., how long you live, then you have to have some sense of understanding what compromises lifespan. So obvious, it's almost not worth stating. Yet. It's interesting to me how little attention is paid to it from the standpoint of prevention. So if you're not a smoker, and that's a big if, um, but you know, smoking rates today in the US are probably in the 16 to 18% range. So still, I think 
unacceptably high, but much lower than they were historically. That's pretty high. It I is. I wasn't even aware. You, you were, yeah, we do expect lower, but you know, I think at one point, gosh, it was probably 40% Damn. in the sixties. Um, so if, if you take smoking out of the equation, what accounts for most deaths is the four horsemen. So what are they? So the first is, is a bucket that I would just refer to as all diseases of the cardiovascular system and atherosclerotic disease. So that would be, you know, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, um, and other, you know, vascular disease as it pertains to the aorta and things like that. So that's, that's bucket number one. And that's true in the United States, but it's also true worldwide. It's true in men and it's true in women. So heart disease, uh, which we can just, I'll, you'll hear me use shorthand all the way through. Sometimes I'll just talk about it, ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Number two is cancer. Um, again, I think this is also number two, both for men and women. And it's also, this is also true globally. The gap globally is much bigger. Uh, in the US, it's actually quite close. Cancer and ASCVD are quite close. It, globally, they're not close at all. They're, uh, ASCVD is probably 60 or 70% more deaths than cancer. Um, again, I'm excluding smokers, so I'm taking out chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is a significant cause of death. Uh, but again, it really tracks almost exclusively with smokers. And so then your third bucket is all of the neurodegenerative diseases and dementias. And that's a bit of a, you know, that's not the cleanest way to divide the data because you have certain neurodegenerative diseases that are dementia. So mm -hmm. for example, Lewy body dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia and the most common neurodegenerative disease belong in that bucket. But there are other forms of dementia such as vascular dementia, which is also quite prominent, that is not a neurodegenerative disease, but is you could almost think of it more as belonging in the ASCVD category. So it's a disease that is driven by the same pathology as atherosclerosis, except the organ that we're talking about is the brain as opposed to the heart, as far as the final, you know, proximate cause of demise. And then you sort of get into this fourth and final horseman, which actually on the death certificate doesn't amount to a staggering number of deaths, but it's so important because not only does it result in mortality, but it is the f what I kind of think of as a force multiplier for the others. In other words, if you are along this spectrum of metabolic disease, which we can define in a minute, your risk of those first three horsemen goes up significantly probably anywhere from 40% to 100%. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that metabolic disease? So that would be <clears throat> anything from hyperinsulinemia, which would be the canary in the coal mine to insulin resistance, to all the forms of fat accumulation that are suboptimal, i.e. where fat is not to be accumulating. So NAFLD being the easiest to diagnose and NASH, um, and then all the way to type two diabetes. So that spectrum of diseases, again, clearly results in mortality. There are people who die directly as a result of their type two diabetes. There are people who die directly as a result of liver failure. Uh, in fact, the leading cause of liver transplantation is very rapidly converging on NAFLD and NASH. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is in part due to the miracle drugs that have come along that can eradicate hep C, which was otherwise taking the sole, you know, uh, title of the main cause of liver failure leading to cirrhosis that would ultimately require transplantation. But now that hep C is curable, um, and the incidence of metabolic disease is rising so dramatically, those two things have basically led to a complete flip of that. And, um, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are quickly becoming the main things that drive that. So, so look, you're going to die directly from those things, but the more important point here is when you have those things, even if they don't kill you, they are pouring gasoline on the fire of things that will. No, that's a uh, <clears throat> very all encompassing. I would say as far as, um, framing out, you know, preface of what to focus on and the lowest hanging fruit, I guess, overlap fairly significantly. One thing I think will stand out is what you mentioned at the beginning is the rate or the how many people die from cancer versus 
ASCVD and it being dramatically different in terms of U.S. versus elsewhere, what do you chalk that up to in that difference? I actually chop it, chalk it up to one thing that the U.S. is doing reasonably well, which compared to the rest of the world, which is I think we do have better tools that we're using to delay the onset and 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 probably make it so that less people are dying of heart disease here. Um, if you do look at cardiovascular mortality, it's, it is declining. Mm. Um, n now I would argue it shouldn't be the number one cause of death. I would argue ASCVD shouldn't be on the top 10 causes mm. of death. So I still think, I don't want to suggest that like we're winning because I still think it's an abomination that anybody dies of heart disease because of all the preventable disease, of all the chronic diseases, it's the most preventable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't say that about cancer. I can't say that about neurodegenerative disease. Um, but if you begin the steps of prevention early enough, nobody should die of a heart attack, at least within the first 90 years of their life. Mm. Um, so, so obviously, if you live long enough, I think everybody probably would succumb. If you figured out a way to eradicate every disease except ASCVD, then yes, I think eventually we would all succumb to it. But within a, within a, 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 a generous lifespan, nobody should be dying of this. And, I, and the tools that are required to do that, I think the US probably implements slightly better. Um, it also might be the case, although to be honest with you, I haven't looked into this, so I, I, this is speculation. I do wonder um, what the difference is in US cancer rates versus global cancer rates. There are clearly going to be certain cancers that are different. So for example, um, a cluster of cancers is significantly worse if you have insulin resistance and type two diabetes. I would guess that we're faring much worse on those cancers mm -hmm. than the rest of the world. Um, so again, I, there, there could be many factors that explain that gap, but it is, it's, 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 it's literally to the tune of 13 million versus 19 million globally. Okay. Huge gap. Hmm. See, I wasn't sure if it was that cancer was much more prevalent in the U S but it sounds like it's largely that ASCVD is maybe managed to a proportion. I think it's managed better here. And like I said, maybe certain cancers are more prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to believe that lung cancer would be more prevalent globally. And lung cancer is both the leading cancer and the leading cause of cancer mortality. And global rates of smoking are much higher. So I, again, I, this is something that I would probably have to sit down and look at the data to come up with a good answer. Starting from the top with the highest probability of, or the thing that most people are dying from in the Western world, we have ASCVD, that you said shouldn't even be in the top 10, which I'm sure is shocking to a lot of people, unless they've seen your stuff, they're probably fa fairly familiar with it, but um, you write about it in detail in the book, highly recommend you guys read it through, but at a high level, what would you want to see as far as you know, what age you were starting to consider being proactive about this and what are you looking for in biomarkers or feedback otherwise that could indicate I need to get aggressive on this verse, leave it, do nothing kind of thing. Like where, where do you kind of set benchmarks on that? Well, again, it depends what you're optimizing for, but, um, if you're optimizing to not have cardiovascular disease be one of the diseases you die of. And by the way, along the way, you're, you're going to dramatically reduce your risk of dementia as well. So let's say optimizing to reduce your chance of having cardiovascular disease, but simultaneously not hindering quality of life mm -hmm. to any significant degree. Yep. So Again, you have to understand the pathophysiology of the disease to then make sense of what the steps are. And this mm -hmm. is important because in, in biology, it's very difficult to establish causality. Uh, it's much harder than other fields of science. And causality is the most important thing in science. Mm -hmm. um, it's why experiments exist. And it's why prior to the 17th century when Francis Bacon first proposed ideas that would go on to become what we now think of as the scientific method, it was impossible for our species to have critical thought in this regard. And it's why, you know, what I describe in the book is medicine 1.0 existed and it existed for most of human history, which was 
you know, everything from witchcraft to voodoo ideas. And, and it, you know, I'm not saying to be critical of the people who had ideas that, you know, it was bad humors that led to all of our illness. If you don't have a tool, if a tool hasn't been invented, you can't use the tool. And the tool that hadn't been invented was the scientific method. So why am I harping on all of this? Well, I think sometimes we just take for granted today that we have the scientific method, but I think in some ways we've lost a bit of the awe that comes from the times when you can establish causality. And so I'll give you an example that I think is, is, is pretty clear, even though, by the way, the establishment of causality in this case was not done via pure experimentation. And that's the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. So the question one would ask is, do people who smoke get lung cancer at an increased rate because of their smoking? Mm -hmm. um, and the amazing gold standard way to do this would be a randomized control trial. So you would take a whole bunch of people, you would randomize them, and randomization is so important because it ensures the elimination of bias. True randomization means there is no difference now between my groups. Regardless of what they looked like at the outset, there's no difference. Half of the groups would be assigned to smoke cigarettes. The other half of the group would be assigned to do something analogous, but that didn't involve smoking cigarettes. So for example, if the, cigar if the smokers have to smoke a pack a day and go outside every day to do it, you'd make the other people go outside and do something that was you know, hold up something to your mouth that isn't a cigarette, you know, whatever. Like you'd, mm -hmm. you you want to make the experiment as elegant as possible and you'd follow those people for outcomes. Now, not surprisingly, this experiment was never done. Um, instead, a, a, an inferior tool for scientific elucidation was used called epidemiology. And epidemiology says, well, what if we just look at things that have already happened in the past without randomization and see if we can tease out a difference? So what if we look at people and look at them and say, well, look, these people are actually equal in every way, shape, or form that we can discern statistically, except for the fact that these guys smoked and this guys, these guys didn't. And now we look at the difference. And that's kind of the mainstay of how a lot of nutritional research is done. And for the most part, that's not a particularly reliable way to establish information, but there are a set of criteria at which you can start to truly believe you're inferring cause from that analysis. And a guy by the name of Austin Bradford Hill created a set of criteria. I think I list them in the book actually. And depending on how many of these criteria are met, you are more and more likely to believe causality. So without saying much more on that, just for the sake of brevity, suffice it to say that the Austin Bradford Hill criteria for causality in smoking are so overwhelmingly strong that we completely understand that smoking is causally linked to lung cancer. What that means is when you smoke, it is the act of smoking that is giving you lung cancer. It's not, no one disputes that smokers have a higher risk of lung cancer. That's true by a factor of 10, right? It's a thousand percent more likely. But what we're saying is it's not some other factor that we're unaccounting for. It is indeed the smoking. Okay, why did I go on that long tangent? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Because once you establish causality, treatment becomes very clear. Once you establish causality, you now say, what's the way to prevent lung cancer? It's to not smoke. This is very important. Now, does that mean if there was no smoking in the world, there would still be no lung cancer? No, it doesn't, because 15% of lung cancer cases occur in non-smokers, and many smokers do not go on to get lung cancer. So, Causality is not the same as necessity and sufficiency, which are also very important concepts in biology, right? So another thing you always learn in biology, is this necessary? Is X necessary to cause Y? Is X sufficient to cause Y? Smoking is neither necessary nor sufficient, but it is still causal. And therefore elimination of something causal will have a direct effect on eliminating the outcome. And the extent to which it will minimize it is a function of the hazard ratio. And the hazard ratio for smoking is enormous. Okay. So with all that said, now let's turn to your question, which is how do you not get a heart attack, right? How do you not die 
from a heart attack or stroke or one of the other vascular complications associated with AS ASCVD. So now the question is, what are the causal parameters that drive ASCVD? And there are a few. And one of them, by the way, is smoking. Now, smoking is not as strong as it was. So smoking, in terms of the risk reduction for um, heart disease, is not nearly as strong as it is for lung cancer. So if you eliminate smoking, you will reduce the risk because it is causal, but the impact won't be that huge. Because again, smoking is neither necessary nor sufficient. Another causal input is blood pressure. Um, I think blood pressure, by the way, is the lowest hanging fruit here. And I also think it's the most uh, poorly diagnosed. So there is truly an epidemic of people walking around. I, I guarantee you, I don't know, a non-trivial number of people listening to us speak right now have undiagnosed hypertension. They just aren't aware of it, right? It's not being checked. They're not going to the doctor. And they're walking around with a blood pressure of 135 over 85. And maybe they've even had that checked and they've been told, yeah, it's probably okay. It's just white coat hypertension or something like that. Um, but this is, a, this is an enormous problem. And again, the data are unambiguous through randomized control trials that if you lower blood pressure, you reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. So that's another thing we want to really make sure is completely dialed in. But again, hypertension is neither necessary nor sufficient. It fits in the same category as cigarettes. And the hazard ratio is not enormous. It's probably 1.4-ish. So if you eliminate hypertension, maybe you have a, I don't know, it depends on the hazard ratio. We call it a 20 to 40% relative risk reduction. But stack that on with smoking. So, so far we've established don't smoke and make sure your blood pressure is better than 120 over 80. And presumably to monitor that in real time, you would have a cuff at home that is... Yeah, cuff at home is something we have all of our patients use. Um, there is a device um, called Actia, A-K-T-I-I-A, that is approved in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it is not yet approved in the US. The FDA has been dragging its feet, but it's a continuous blood pressure monitor and it's really oh, great. It's just a little cool. bracelet. So, you know, hopefully that'll get approved and then, you know, it'll be much easier to measure people's blood pressure clinically. And you found that to be accurate relative to It's manual? as accurate as any cuff is. Now, I don't think man I don't think automated cuffs are nearly as accurate as manual. So, do you get the artificial raising of your systolic like you do with the other automated cuffs yes how I, much about 10 millimeters of mercury so be, luckily my wife is really good she can take yeah. my blood pressure so i always have my wife check a manual read on a blood pressure and then i'll check with a cuff simultaneously and it's always at least 10 millimeters of mercury higher systolically and the reason for that it sounds like you already know quite a bit about this topic why that's the case yeah enough I would love for you to explain further. I actually got my first manual cuff relatively recently, but I've noticed the same phenomenon where I have artificial spike essentially in my systolic as well when I use these automated devices. Yeah, I think it has to do, so when you're doing it, when you're using an oscillatory measurement, you can, you can hear the flow of blood, mm -hmm. right? So you're actually measuring systole which is the first bit of blood flow that comes in after t as you're alleviating total occlusion. And then diastole is when you have basically complete restoration of total flow. So you measure one, you measure the other. Automated cuffs don't work that way. Automated cuffs are measuring mean arterial pressure and then they're imputing systolic and diastolic pressure. Mm -hmm. And I, we haven't found amazing data as to what are the factors that are leading to this elevation in systolic blood pressure in some people. Um, I've heard various explanations. Um, the more muscle you have in the arm relative to fat mass, the more likely you are to see it. Obviously, any error in terms of cuff placement or mismatch or you know poor alignment of cuff will also play a role in that. But it's... You know, it's just something I've become aware of. And, and at some point for me, the gap was even larger. I mean, at one point, my cuff reading was so high, I thought I needed to start taking medication for blood pressure. But this didn't jive with my feeling, which is I'm usually kind of lightheaded when I stand up. Like I've, 
I, I, I feel like I have kind of low blood pressure, mm -hmm. but then I'm getting these cuff readings of like 135 over 85. And only then when I had both my doctor and then my wife start doing lots of manual checks that I realized, no, your blood pressure is actually like 105 over 70. And, um, <laughs> you know, those automated cuffs are problematic. Um, so anyway, that said, this is as good an automated cuff as any. And I just know in my mind, like if that thing's reading 120 over 80, I'm probably 110 over 75. Yeah. I guess once you've got your pattern established, as long as it's consistently with that elevation, you know what the real number would be proportionally. Yeah. So, But it's good that you're checking your blood pressure. Again, I really think more people need to do this. I and think one of the biggest causes of death in bodybuilders unaddressed sleep apnea blood pressure like hugely overlooked yep yeah. so then the third piece that you want to look at and this one i think is the most interesting is the causal relationship with uh, ldl mm. low density lipoprotein and maybe more importantly apob so apob is the protein that wraps around not just ldls but vldls and if you know the ApoB concentration, you know the concentration of all atherogenic particles, which are LDLs, LP little a's, VLDLs, and IDLs, although clinically they don't really matter that much. And this is what's interesting because unlike blood pressure and smoking, which are neither necessary nor sufficient, ApoB is necessary, though not sufficient. So here you have a causal marker that is necessary you can't develop atherosclerosis without it, though it's not sufficient. You can have it and not develop atherosclerosis. So this becomes, I think, one of the most interesting ways to consider prevention, which is if you reduce ApoB to a physiologic level, i.e. the level of a child, and you keep it there, it seems improbable that you could develop ASCVD. And if you wanted to take a belt and suspenders approach, you would do all the things, right? You wouldn't smoke, you'd have good blood pressure, and you would have an ApoB level mm -hmm. at the level of a child. And the challenge is that while clearly having very, very low LDL is not problematic, it's not an essential uh, molecule in our body. And we know this, by the way, because there are a handful of people out there that have genetic mutations, such as people who have hypofunctioning PCSK9, who have insanely low LDL cholesterol, like, you know, 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. So, you know, their level is like one tenth of, you know, what you might expect to see in a, in a normal person. And they have no deficits as a result of this, right? Like, so they have no cognitive deficits. They have no deficits in strength or function or anything like that. The only difference between them and the rest of us is they just, they just don't get cardiovascular disease. Similarly, if you look at kids, they have, you know, LDL cholesterol levels that are, you know, one third to one quarter the level of an adult. And of course, they're in the most demanding period of anabolic growth and the most demanding period of CNS growth. And again, they do this without any compromise. Again, this is not hard to understand if you understand lipid metabolism and understand that the cholesterol you measure in a person's blood is like, you know, on the order of 10% of total body pool of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you reduced a person's cholesterol in the blood to zero, you're only taking away 10% of the total, the total body pool of cholesterol. So steroidal tissue, um, and cells in general need cholesterol. I mean, cholesterol is an essential molecule for life, but it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a misunderstanding to suggest that you need cholesterol and LDL particles. So I know one of the things people are thinking, similar to our discussion about inhibiting aromatase, is in serum estradiol is just representative of what is floating around in circulation, but is not necessarily reflective of tissue levels because yep. it is a you know a hormone that seems to be actually aromatized within different tissues in the body in proportionally different amounts to achieve some physiologic estrogen receptor activation with the ldl how you're mentioning how if you you know inhibit it down to zero it doesn't affect the other are you able to do that specifically like where you inhibit just serum and leave tissue intact yeah so so to be clear Tissue cholesterol um, is in some ways, you know, impacted by LDL, but mm -hmm. it's mostly the liver, right? So LDL's primary job seems to be bringing cholesterol back to the liver. Mm -hmm. And you, 
the 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 way to mainly regulate LDL is to regulate how much cholesterol the liver sees. Mm. Uh, and also how much fat it sees, by the way. So that's why a diet very high in saturated fat will often drive up LDL. Why? Well, in it partially induces the, sat the synthesis of cholesterol, but a far more potent manner in which it does is as the liver sees more saturated fat, it inhibits um, S SRB1 and that causes... Uh, which is a sterile regulatory binding protein one. And that causes the liver to say, I don't want any more fat in here. I'm going to pull my LDL receptors down or downregulate them. So I'll make fewer of them. And all of a sudden you will have more LDL in the periphery. So that's why a person on a very high saturated fat diet, you see this all the time with people who go on high fat diets, not, not all of them, because you have to be the sort of, there's, it has to be a genetic susceptibility to this. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see this huge rise in LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol. But if you knock LDL, meaning low density lipoproteins down to a very low level, such that the concentration of ApoB goes from being, you know, 100 milligrams per deciliter, which might be the 50th percentile, to 30 milligrams per deciliter, which is less than the fifth percentile, so you're in the probably in the first percentile, mm -hmm. you're not impacting the amount of cholesterol in the cell. You're just impacting the amount of carrier moving back and forth between cells. But the cells make all the cholesterol they need. And the only exceptions to that are during periods like, you know, again, during... Uh, maturity, sexual maturity, when hormones are going through the roof because estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, even cortisol are all made on cholesterol backbones, which again speaks to the point, clearly it's not inhibited to the point where it's clinically relevant because, you know, uh, a 14 year old kid has an incredibly low LDL mm -hmm. and yet they're ramping up all those hormones. So they're in sort of max demand um, and they're not impeded by it. So as long as, is it more that it's by proxy of no decrease in relevant metrics that are a something supported by cholesterol that we're inferring that there's no decline in cell concentration? Yes, and, and really what it comes down to, so if you wanted to, if you said, look, how would we implement such a change? I mean, it's going to have to be done pharmacologically, mm -hmm. right? Or genetically. So you could do it genetically, but you know, that's probably still some years away. So if you genetically knock out PCSK9, you, you'd render everybody like those people I talked about that were discovered by a scientist named Helen Hobbs more than 20 years ago. So these are people who, like I said, they just they found families of people who don't have any LDL and don't have any cardiovascular disease. And this was the gene that was, um, it's not fully knocked out. It's just hypofunctioning. Mm. But if you knock that gene out completely, like you would have no LDL because you'd basically have tons of LDL receptors on your liver that would never get inhibited. And they would just be mopping all the LDL out of circulation. Um, so aside from doing that genetically, could you not infer that it's a bleed into circulation from the cells though? Like mm, say more. So hypothetically, if we have intra tissue synthesis, you have an achievement of physiologic activity, whatever you're trying to do. Yep. And then presumably to metabolize it, you are circulating it back to actually get pulled from serum in that process. We're assuming that the functions have been adequately satisfied and then it's pulled out of serum subsequent to that or? Yeah, not really. I mean, I think I understand what you're saying. I might not, but, but I think, um, it's not like a bathtub if that's mm -hmm. what, because it sounds like what you're saying is like, is there a bathtub effect where only when the bathtub is full, does the excess water spill out? And it's that excess water that we're measuring in the periphery. Sure. Yeah. yeah I don't think it's quite that way because there, there really are only a couple of places where this is tightly regulated, the liver and the gut tend to be two of those places. Mm -hmm. 
it's also important to remember that you will still have movement of cholesterol throughout the body without ApoB because you still have ApoA. Mm. ApoA is what's on the HDL particle. So HDL will still transport cholesterol back and forth. Right now, LDL does the lion's share of it because we have much more LDL um, uh, and they're bigger, but HDL can transport cholesterol. So we don't really seem to have any functional deficit with n near non-existent LDL. Okay. The biggest challenge, which gets to your question of like, how would you do this without compromising quality of life? Yeah. Well, I think if you were trying to do this 40 years ago, you couldn't. Yeah. Like this was a theoretical idea, but you couldn't do it because the only tool you had was a horrible drug called a bile acid sequesterant, which had such awful side effects, like you'd end up having diarrhea for your entire life to be able to get enough cholesterol yeah. out of your body and, and God knows what else. So fast forward 20 years ago, if this was your objective, you'd have to put everybody on the highest dose of statins. And for some people, you would probably achieve a low enough level of ApoB that it becomes irrelevant. But even for those people, you would have perhaps a side effect profile that would be unacceptable. Hmm. Um, so on a maximum dose of statins, you're gonna see a non-trivial amount of muscle pain, a non-trivial amount of people that are being induced with insulin resistance. Um, and so obviously to me, those would both be totally unacceptable side. I mean, you would never accept insulin resistance and uh, muscle pain mm -hmm. in exchange for that. But where we are today with the next generation drugs on this, including injectable PCSK9 inhibitors and a drug like bempidoic acid, which is a drug that in the liver only, so it's a pro drug that only gets metab that only turns into the active drug when the liver metabolizes it from the pro drug into the active drug, and therefore its it, its activity is limited to the liver. And it's only in the liver that it inhibits cholesterol synthesis, which tells the liver, oh my God, cholesterol synthesis is impaired. I need more cholesterol. Good news for everybody. More LDL receptors, lower LDL as I'm bringing more in. But it, it doesn't do any of that in the muscle, which is what the statins are doing. So you don't have that effect of insulin resistance. You don't have any muscle soreness. Um, we're, there are now you know, newer and newer drugs that are coming out. Um, including uh, another class of drug that looks incredibly promising uh, called the CPET inhibitor that um, historically have been very uninteresting drugs, but there's a current one in phase two that looks very promising and is using a very different approach to um, CTEP. I said CPET earlier, I meant CTEP, but to CTEP inhibition. Yeah, I uh, listened to your podcast with I forget his name. Probably, Probably John Casterlin. Yeah, it sounded unreal. Yeah. Is that something that... I, I'm very interested in seeing what comes of that because that's a drug where you're having this remarkable benefit with respect to cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. which is historically where people have pursued CTEP inhibitors. Um, but also now you have this enormous improvement in insulin sensitivity and potentially neuroprotection as well. So I don't know. At this point, honestly, the drug sounds too good to be true. This so is obistripib. Yes. Correct? Yep. Okay. So this hypothetically, and it's oral. Yeah. So you could hypothetically replace everything with it, or you would depending remains on to be seen, but my guess is assuming it turns out to be as good in phase three as it was in phase two, maybe you're stacking that with an injectable PCSK9. Okay. And what do you think currently, obviously it depends on the predisposition and how the person arrives at those levels in their blood and what have you, but what is like, is the kind of three drugs that kind of dominate the sphere, azetamibe, azetamibe bempidoic acid, and rapatha, PCS? I would inhibitor? still say that statins would still dominate the sphere because we do have so much data on them, right? Like mm -hmm. we really know their efficacy. It's a known known, right? So mm -hmm. we, we know what the side effects are, right? Like we know what to look for. It's, you know, we probably have a billion patient years of statin use. Like that's, there's not many drugs that you can say, you, you know, meaning like if you take the number of years times number of patient lives that have been on it probably amounts to a billion. Um, so I, I still think statins are probably the workhorse. There's prop, you know, these days, 
you know, there are probably nine out there. I, I mean, we, we would, we would only use three in our practice and probably only two now. So we're very quick to pivot away if we're not happy with it. Um, but let's be clear my patients are less cost sensitive and therefore we have the luxury of not having to fiddle around to find the perfect statin. Now, ezetimibe is not particularly expensive, which is great news. Um, it's the least potent of all of those. Um, and, and, you know, um, the point here is between statins, BPA, ezetimibe, PCSK9 inhibitors, there's no reason anybody has to walk around with an ApoB above the fifth percentile of the population. So your threshold where I think I've heard you quoted as saying, you don't see a reason why anyone should need to walk around with a ApoB above 60. I think yeah, that's the fifth percentile, 60 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And that target, is that a target that you've gradually dialed into over the years or like how long has that been your yeah no it's it's uh, my my target has gradually gotten lower and lower as the data both mm -hmm. from clinical trials mendelian randomization mechanistic studies it all keeps pointing in this direction lower is better lower is better lower is better i mean you don't get a lot of things in biology where that's true yeah right like very rarely do you get kind of monotonic functions in biology. Most things in biology are use and inverted use. Mm -hmm. But occasionally you do get these hardline J's where it, you know, it's like doo -doo 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 -doo, and then maybe there's a little bit of this or doo -doo 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 -doo, and maybe there's a little bit of that. And I think with ApoB we're talking about that, you know. So maybe if your ApoB were zero, there might be a problem that, you know, no one's been able to extrapolate from even the MR studies. But clearly going down to 10 to 20, which is, I mean, so low that just, we can't find any evidence of that being problematic. Right. So I think in many ways, honestly, Derek, we're limited by the side effects of the medications at this point. Like we're not, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And therefore, as the meds have gotten so much better in the last eight years, it's really opened up, you know, and, and again, I think about like how young I am in my career. I mean, I've only been doing this for, you know, in this format for a decade, mm -hmm. what I've seen in a decade and how it's allowed me to change what we do. Uh, it's, I can't wait to see what the next decade holds. So if you were to go back in time, at what age would you start crushing ApoB? Well, I'm a, you know, I'm an interesting case because heart disease is so prevalent in my family, right? So my story is, you know, every male in my family dies of or has very premature heart disease, right? So my dad, you know, lost a brother in his 40s, another in his 50s. You know, my dad had a stent placed when he was 60. And um, and so when I was 35, I had a calcium score. And, you know, I'm insanely fit at this point in time. Um, and my calcium, and by the way, my lipids are not horrible, right? Like my LDL cholesterol was probably... 120 milligrams per deciliter at the time. I didn't even know what ApoB was, so that wouldn't have been checked. So 120 milligrams per deciliter for LDL is about the 50th percentile. Um, but nothing that anybody would care about. But I, you know, really, really insisted to my doc that I get a calcium score. And he was kind of like, you're 35. Like, I, you know, just, so we get a calcium score and it comes back six. Um, so a little tiny speck of calcium in the left anterior descending artery. And he's kind of like, eh, it's like, it's not really worth doing anything about. And that was kind of like, so this is 15 years ago. That was, you know, you asked earlier, what was my motivation? That was really the, the, like the, I got to like, I don't know that I trust him. You know, he's a good guy, but he might be over his skis on this. Like, I, I'm not going to go down this path. Yeah. So that's when I became obsessed. So, so look. And even though that sounds insignificant at that age having, and this is like a, an artifact of like, I don't know, like, how would you explain calcification where it's not representative of current plaque? Yeah, calcification is the final stage of plaque stabilization. Mm -hmm. So what it says is on that little part of my coronary artery, there's a big, there's a little tiny speck of calcium that my body has put there just like it would lay down new bone to cover up a plaque to prevent it from becoming unstable. So 
it's certainly not like looking at that test, I was in danger of anything. I mean, my coronary arteries were wide open. Mm. You know, I had an athlete's heart, but it's, you know, I, I think I use this example in the book. It's like driving through a neighborhood and seeing bars on the windows. Mm. That tell, if there are bars on the windows, there's a reason for it. Something yeah. bad had to happen. Like when you came to my house, did you notice any bars on the window? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, it's a different world when when you do right. It's the difference between being in, you know, middle of the U.S. and maybe being, you know, in the middle of Sao Paulo. Right. You're going to see a very different environment. How many years after? is the calcification kind of this process takes decades so what that tells you is this process starts in our teenage years mm -hmm. and i actually have a figure in the book of an autopsy of a, i think it's a 24 year old guy who dies as a victim of a homicide and you can see he's already got a mature lesion in one of his coronary arteries, not a calcified. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't have shown up on a calcium scan. If he did a CT angiogram, it might've shown up as a soft plaque. But again, the good news is this is a process that takes decades. Um, the bad news is this is a process that takes decades and most people aren't starting, you know, until there's something obvious. Like if you wait, if, you're, if your goal is, I'm gonna wait till I have calcium in my coronary arteries, you know, it, it, that's just such an irrational point of view when you consider how long it takes to develop that and how much disease is present. So, you know, in retrospect, gosh, I should have been on something probably when I was 20, hmm. right? Um, now, the good news is 15 years after that scan, my scan looks identical. Hmm. So at, at a, I've been very fortunate that I have completely halted that. Uh, in fact, if anything, it, you can sort of see it's funny. I had a follow-up CT angiogram like six years later and it was zero. But it's because when calcium is that small, the calcium scan without a CT angiogram is reading pretty big cuts and it just missed it. Mm -hmm. So it said zero, but on the angiogram, you can see it because the cuts are really fine and you could see it was the same. And then I repeated it like a year ago and the calcium score came back as two. So it went from six to zero to two. But if you go back and look for 15 years, it's the exact same speck of calcium mm. and the CTA is fine. So I feel very fortunate that like I had a wake up call and, you know, you know, we're just going to, you know, kind of keep this thing arrested. So for somebody who is opposed to pharmacologic intervention to crush or you know just lower their apob and get closer to the kind of threshold where it's essentially impossible to accumulate plaque would you be recommending more frequent ct angiograms to assess for well not necessarily because if they're morally opposed to doing anything about it what's the point well assuming that they need to see something going wrong to justify drug use oh i see well i mean sure some people for just don't want they want to be natural oh i'm like my carnivore diet can't cause plaque buildup you know there's a lot of oh, people that yeah i mean look i i, I think you, you kind of have to know the person if, if a person says look um i have no interest in you know pharmacology. Um, but if there's a real reason to do something about it, like if I have cancer, I'll do something. Um, then I would say, okay, so that's, so you don't want to do primary prevention, but you're willing to do secondary prevention, which means take prevention after there's evidence of damage. Mm -hmm. Historically, the term secondary prevention means prevention after you've had a heart attack. But I think that's a, an awful use of the term. I think we should describe secondary prevention as prevention once there is radiographic evidence of atherosclerosis. Right. Once you have documented uh, atherosclerosis, then anything you do, so you could argue what I did was really early secondary prevention. And yes, if, if that's gonna help a person, then I would say, sure, you should probably be doing a CT angiogram because I think that's the most sensitive test we've got. Quick note from one of our sponsors, Magic Spoon. You guys are probably wondering, what are these little boxes? Are they kid-sized, you know, cereal boxes or what is this? 
No, in fact, it is Magic Spoon Treats. They're new, sort of like Rice Krispie Treat high protein snacks for on the go. And it's the same quality taste that you know and love from their high protein, low carb, you know, sugar-free cereal with these same natural sweeteners, by the way. So if you're wondering, you know, still sweetened with stevia, monk fruit, there's no artificial sweeteners. If those happen to be, you know, GI distressing for you, these things are money, 130 calories, 11 grams protein, tastes phenomenal. So for me, I really like these things. They're not very messy. They're, they don't melt or anything weird in your hands. They're pretty clean. They're on the go. They're great. They taste insane. But it's kind of wild. They're able to continue to crush these awesome flavors with just natural sweeteners. I've always been very impressed with Magic Spoon and their product quality, as well as their macronutrients, like, you know, the protein relative to the essentially no sugar, almost no net carbs, 130 calories, and their cereal, you know, essentially more or less the same with per serving, 130, 140 calories, you know, 11, 12 grams of protein. They use actual whey. They don't use shitty quality protein. Like it's good stuff that I have loved for years and um, I continue to munch it on a regular basis. So you can check it out. If you are interested, click the link below to try Magic Spoon's new treats today. Be sure to check out both delicious protein pack flavors, marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. I like the marshmallow probably the best. It's uh, kind of reminiscent of the you know frosted flavor of their cereal, which is you know, a crowd favorite. Click the link in below or scan. There's a QR code now on the screen that you can use too. Use code Derek for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash Derek, save $5 off your order today. And don't forget to add marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter treats to your order. If you're just getting cereal, give up the treats a try if you are interested. And for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon also ships to the Canada, to the Canada, to Canada and the UK. Um, I used to literally drive over the border to a PO box to pick this stuff up before they shipped to Canada, but it's now in Canada which is great in the UK. So check it out and back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay. And why do you think it is that people are so dogmatic about cholesterol and its impact on atherosclerosis? Like a lot of people want to assert if I have no inflammation, I'm insulin sensitive, etc. I can't have plaque accumulation. And as long as I stay metabolically fit and healthy, then it's not a concern. Like, are these people just completely neglecting everything intentionally to not make their diet models seem bad? Or like, what do you think is the, like, I just have a hard time wrapping my head around somebody who has a, you know, almost a self-induced familial hypercholesterolemia level from their carnivore diet saying something like, don't worry about it. I don't know that I can answer that question. And I, I, certainly have spent some time in the past trying to understand that. Mm. Um, and I've even used the example of FH to try to make the point, right? So for people watching us who don't know what that is. So FH is a disease called familial hy hypercholesterolemia. And it's uh, actually the second most common genetic cause of atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. Um, now it's a disease, it's genetic disease, but it's a polygenic disease and it's very heterogeneous, meaning it's not like, you know, Huntington's disease where there's one gene that causes the disease or even LPA where the single LPA gene leads to elevated LP little a, which is actually the most common familial form of atherosclerosis. Here you have literally thousands of different mutations that all produce the same phenotype. And the disease is defined by the phenotype, not the genotype. So FH is defined by having an LDL cholesterol greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter. So what do we know about people with familial hypercholesterolemia? Well, we know that regardless of their metabolic status, regardless of their inflammation, regardless of how high their HDL is and how low their triglycerides are and all the other things that people in this camp want to talk about, they still get accelerated atherosclerosis at an enormous rate. And their atherosclerotic risk can be almost completely attenuated by lipid lowering therapy. In fact, if lipid lowering therapy is initiated early enough, and now that we have better and better genetic screening for this. We are able to treat people in their teenage years when they have this condition, they go on to live normal lives. But the key is, because it's basically an area under the curve problem. 
how high and how long is your exposure to ApoB. So, you know, if you don't diagnose somebody with FH until they're 50, they, you know, they might not live a totally normal lifespan. But if you diagnose somebody at 20, they almost assuredly will, provided you get the LDL low enough. So, um, again, I've never heard a compelling answer for why FH isn't at least one model here. Furthermore, the Mendelian randomization very clearly establishes the causality of LDL. So I suppose you would have to come up with an argument, which I am not aware of, that would say, even though LDL is causal, because you can't dispute that, I mean, not if you understand mathematics and science, even if LDL is causal, there's something so protective about my fill in the blank diet that it offsets any of the harm of LDL in a way that the person with familial hypercholesterolemia who's eating a normal diet doesn't have. Hmm. Even though on the surface, by all measurable accounts, we're both the same insulin sensitivity, low inflammation, et cetera. Again, part of what makes this difficult is that people confuse causality with sufficiency. And again, this is where I think everybody would benefit from just like a very simple course in formal logic and, and maybe philosophy of logic or something like that, right? So, so what happens is it's sort of like you, your grandmother smoked a pack a day her whole life and she's totally fine, therefore smoking <laughs> is fine, yeah. right? That, that you've got to be very careful when you cherry pick mm -hmm. because you can get burned. Yeah. It doesn't mean that smoking isn't 1,000% more likely to cause lung cancer because, you know, grandma didn't get it. How typical is it to be able to manage this entirely through lifestyle, diet, et cetera, for a person at average risk? Again, it depends what time horizon we're talking about, right? So I think... I think let's just say from teenagehood to end of life, they're eating what you would consider to be a high quality diet, exercising regularly, insulin sensitive, has built a good amount of muscle. They have average genes. They don't have any protective ones, nor do they have any that are brutally problematic. Yeah. Like why, what is it about our evolution that hasn't kind of like figured out that even the average person might still need pharmacology to, you know, yeah, and I don't think evolution offers a great insight here because actually evolution was trying to optimize around something else. Um, I actually discussed this on my podcast once and I can't remember who was the guest, but we had a very interesting discussion. It might've been John actually about how we may have actually evolved to have lots of ApoB because we're one of the few species that do, by the way. So most most animals out there don't have ApoB, like they don't get atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. So we're one of the few species that does. And I think it was John hypothesized that it could be due to the enormous energetic cost of making cholesterol. Now, it's not an energetic cost anymore because we have so much food around us, it doesn't freaking matter. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that 250,000 years ago, everything about us was really, really thrifty. And with us becoming the apex predator, the most dominant species on this planet, well, it was entirely predicated on our brains. Mm -hmm. So for example, that's the reason we can get so fat, right? Like we can get way fatter than other animals because we developed this capacity to store virtually unlimited quantities of energy. Mm -hmm. Had we not done that, if we didn't, you know, if we didn't have the ability to put lipoprotein lipase onto uh, an adipose cell, for example, and figure out ways to make triglycerides and in massive quantities shove them in our fat cells, something that today we all consider undesirable. Mm. But lest we forget, if we didn't do that, you and I wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be swimming in a pond together with like, you know, five neurons, right? So, I mean, there's a, there was an enormous energetic cost to becoming the species we are. And one of the consequences of that might have been the development of ApoB, which allows us to have to rely less on cholesterol synthesis and more on cholesterol recirculation. Okay. So it, it, you could almost argue that evolution, well, we certainly know evolution didn't care about how long you lived. It only cared about your ability to pass on your genes. So 
I could see a scenario where evolution was actually driving us towards atherosclerosis. Not that it knew what that was, but as a means to make our cholesterol demands less from an ATP perspective, i.e. less energy, because it's very energy intensive to make cholesterol. Um, anything you can do to save ATP, you would have done. And you know, here we are 250,000 years later, and we're paying the price because we've solved the energy problem. Mm. When it comes to modulating blood pressure, I want to try and fire through this because I want to be mindful of your time and I can't believe I'm already at an hour and 15 minutes. Jeez. Um, for blood pressure modulation, like you said, it's the lowest hanging fruit. Like you can check it easily at home. How would you like first line of defense? This one is all about, yeah. First line defense here is not pharmacotherapy. It is weight management and exercise in that order. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it's like for every pound of weight loss, you're going to get like, I don't know, half a millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic diastolic. Like it's on the order of that magnitude. Mm. Um, for every, gosh, like for every two hours, and, and again, I don't want to be quoted on these numbers because it's just directional, but like yeah. there's a metric, like for every X hours of aerobic activity per week, there's like a 10 point reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So, you know, I think many people who have stage one hypertension can be fixed without pharmacotherapy. And it really comes down to those are the big two. There's also something around sodium modulation. So I had a podcast with a guy named Rick Johnson, who's a nephrologist and talked about the literature showing how it's not so much the absolute sodium content you consume, but it's the dilution of sodium in your food. So you could have two people that are both eating four grams a day of sodium, but the it depends on how much water is being paired with that sodium. So if one person is like, you know, thirsty while they're eating their potato chips mm -hmm. and the other person is drinking a ton of water with their potato chips, they're going to have a completely different hemodynamic response to it. So the more concentrated your sodium consumption, the higher the blood pressure goes. This is very interesting and it might explain why there is really so much confusion around the role of sodium in hypertension management and the data are so conflicting. It could simply be that this might be the missing link in there and that sodium does matter, but not in absolute quantity the way people assume. If all these things don't work, you know, there really is a condition called essential hypertension. In other words, there is truly still this phenomenon where some people who are doing all the right things, and I have patients like this where they're lean, they're metabolically healthy, like there's nothing they're doing out there. And yet if you, if, if you didn't put them on a medicine, they'd be 140 over 90. And so we do also turn to pharmacology here. And I think we should have a very, very uh, short uh, hurdle to do so if all the other things aren't working. And by the way, there's no shame in putting a person on the medication while you work through those other things. So if I have a person who's hypertensive, I'm probably going to put them on medication while we do those other things. And the success story is weaning them off that hypertensive medicine. But you just don't need any endothelial exposure to hypertension. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, there's, there's no scenario by which having high blood pressure is good. It's so bad for the heart and it's so bad for the brain and it's so bad for the kidneys. And you and I spoke earlier about, Hey, like, yeah, in fact, this is actually a perfect parallel to something you and I spoke about on the other podcast, which was hair loss, mm. right? Like if, if a guy's hair is falling out and he wants to do something about it, like the time to do it is now don't wait a year until you've lost more follicles to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if your blood pressure is high, you are killing nephrons every single day, the functional unit of your kidney. And once they're gone, they never come back. And as much as I'm sure people don't want to lose their hair, it's way worse to lose your kidneys. Mm -hmm. So if your blood pressure is high, get it treated while you're losing weight, improving metabolic health, getting rid of your sleep apnea, another huge preventable cause, by the way. So sleep apnea left untreated needs to be treated. All these things super much matter. Question on sleep apnea. If somebody was to use a CPAP to like correct their sleep apnea, but they stay awake or, you know, something that they still have their sleep apnea, they're just, you know, it's a band-aid, yeah. all but a very effective one. I literally use one myself. That therapy, do you find, or have you seen any literature that shows? If that's better than the full metabolic correction of it? Like if I was to... 
be on CPAP versus force, like, I guess I could, I would have to lose however much more weight, but no matter how lean I get, I never get rid of it. But the lifespan of somebody who, if they at the same body composition are on CPAP versus if they didn't have sleep apnea and they weren't on CPAP, if that makes sense. Like, I, I, know I understand the question, but I don't know the data. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, I know you question. couldn't control for it really at all because ultimately you're the guy with sleep apnea and you're yep. not going to get rid of it unless it's caused by right. excessive obesity, what have you. But, you know, I definitely do even think for myself, I'm just, you know, I use a CPAP and on paper, all the metrics show AI chat, AI HI metrics are good. There's no existing sleep apnea anymore. Um, you know, my resting heart rate looks solid. You know, everything looks okay on paper, but at the end of the day, I still have a hose shooting air through my nose to breathe. Is that going to be the same outcome as a guy who's just lying there breathing? Good yeah. question. My <laughs> guess is you're way closer to the guy who's just breathing but maybe it's just asymptotically getting there. You know, maybe it's not identical, but I don't think you're splitting the difference would be my intuition. Do you have any like hard hitting facts on lifespan decrease from untreated extreme sleep apnea? Just like any kind of, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but I remember it was like, even when I got diagnosed almost 10 years ago, at least it was my sleep specialist, probably just pulling it out of his ass, but he said, you're probably going to die by the time you're 30 if you don't treat it. It was that extreme. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that's, I would be doubtful of that, but I'm yeah, just wondering that, that if that seems a bit much. Um, you know, I mean, I look, look, I think there's two things, right? I mean, I think one, you know, deaths from apnea are pretty rare. Yeah. The, the more common. But it's an way, accumulative. Yeah. What's more common is what is apnea doing to your metabolic health? Mm -hmm. Like, how is it increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease? How is it increasing your risk of insulin resistance and type two diabetes? Mm. Um, I, I can't tell you though, off the top of my head that I know the hazard ratios for how much it's increasing the risk of each of the horsemen. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely a s terrifyingly overlooked problem, I think. And a lot of people think because they don't like the inconvenience and strangeness of wearing a device like that, that they will just deal with it. But it's so, so impactful in a negative way. It's baffling that people just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. So that I would say reasonably comprehensively covers, you know, cardiovascular disease and the main things to be looking at as far as the other Horsemen, um, I know there is overlap. So I guess the main one that is scares the most people and I would want the most clarity on myself is cancer screening. So obviously a lot of people can see family history and know if their grandma died from this or had their grandpa had prostate cancer or what have you. If you were to be doing, I don't know, what would be the preventative screening tactics that you would be recommending it at what age? Like, is it a pernuvo full body MRI or like, what would you be in? I don't know, recommending and at what age would you start looking for that sort of thing? You know, I think this is one where it's, it's, I, I think it's actually less clear how prescriptive one needs to be because I think here there's a much greater cost for screening uh, in terms of risk. So a lot of the stuff that we think about from prevention of cardiovascular disease is both economically inexpensive, but also risk inexpensive. I think when it comes to cancer, I spend a lot of time kind of trying to gauge the risk appetite of a person before, you know, weighing in on this. So, you know, basically I would divide costs into three buckets. Like there's the economic cost, there's the emotional cost, and then there's the physical harm risk cost. And so, you know, let's take an example. So colonoscopy comes with a really legitimate physical risk. Uh, it's not big, but it is not zero. And the older you get, the bigger the risk. So the risks are effectively risks associated with the bowel prep. So again, for someone your age, my age, doesn't, there's no chance of anything going wrong. But as you get older, the risk of dehydration and electrolyte abnormality becomes, you know, non-trivial, you know, get somebody goes into AFib or they pass out and you get the you know, end when they're dehydrated. Then you have the, uh, anesthetic risk. So it's a sedation 
you know, again, this is a relatively, <laughs> these are all very low risks, but again, they're not zero. Something can go wrong in a sedation. And then you have the risk of bleeding or perforation from the procedure itself. So taken together, all of those risks are low, but again, they're not zero. And that's when coupled with the cost of doing colonoscopy, you know, the reason we don't recommend doing it six, every six months. Because if you did it every six months, you'd eliminate colon cancer. I mean, and colon cancer is the third leading cause of cancer death, but it's a type of cancer that progresses in what's called a very Halsteadian way, meaning it is a very clear, well-defined series of steps that are purely observable, where you go from normal colon to polyp or adenomatous accumulation of tissue to dysplastic cells, so cells that go from just proliferating to changing their form to cancer, invasive cancer. And that's a very clear progression. And with that clear progression, especially when it occurs outside the body, which the colon is, means you can directly visualize it. Outside the body just means it's exposed to the outside world. Mm -hmm. People are saying, what do you mean your colon's outside your body? <laughs> you can intervene. And like I said, if you do a thought experiment, you did a colonoscopy on everybody every six months, there'd be no colon cancer because six months is not long enough for that process to happen. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how long that process takes. Um, and studies are all over the place on trying to estimate this and they're confounded by potentially bad bowel preps that have missed things previously. But you know, there are certainly some studies that say that can happen in less than a year. I think that's probably aggressive and it's probably a couple of years, but that might suggest for the most aggressive screening, the interval at which you'd wanna do it. Now, we have a patient in our practice who has a genetic syndrome that predisposes him to colon cancer. He gets colonoscopy every single year. I do it every three years, even though I have no genetic predisposition, but I just don't like unforced errors in my life. And I feel like, you know, getting colon cancer would be a really, really bad outcome. So how are you checking the genetic predispositions? Is it through like the, I don't it know. always starts with family history. So okay. a very, a very, very thorough family history is so important. Um, and you know, we have this digital product called early that, um, is, is kind of like a way that we take what we do with our patients and put it into like a kind of like a master class for people to go and do on their own. And it's divided into many modules, but literally we spend an entire module on family history just because it is such an important way to tease this information out. Is like there a various cap types of on cancers. The amount of people who can take that course, by the way. Uh, yes, there was when it came out in May. Mm -hmm. There will be another capped release version in September. And then, uh, and why is that though? Like, isn't it just like a, it's a series of videos yep. in a course structure, correct? Yep. We just want to make sure we can handle all the feedback. Like, uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's it, more to make sure it's a dialed in offering rather than you're actually helping. Well, the, it's just like right now we're doing all the customer. My team is doing all the customer support internally. Gotcha. So we just wanted to keep it very small so that we can, you know, do it and provide great feedback and customer support for folks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> once you know a person's family history, that often then prompts you to go and get genetic testing. And both in cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, you really see a lot of things, you know, oh my God, like father and grandfather both had Parkinson's disease or father and uncle both had prostate cancer or, you know, mother and aunt and you know grandmother had breast cancer or you know and then you start to say okay well look we're gonna we're gonna look for you know either a whole bunch of known snips that are associated with these conditions um or you know do do certain genetic targeting okay so i'd uh just for a quick fire list so even i'm aware what are like the top five most probable cancers like you mentioned that colon yep. was three. so number one is lung okay number two is breast and prostate obviously one sex versus the other mm -hmm. so that's kind of two and three you can think of those like kind of a tie for second although prostate's technically number two breast is number three fourth uh, by the way this is lethality not incidence mm -hmm. so this is deaths from cancer okay. uh four is colon and uh, which is really third for men and third for women, again, based on that. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth is pancreatic, which is actually the most lethal of them all, meaning lethality is the ratio of deaths to diagnoses. 
Okay. So if you have no... And by the way, those five cancers are more than 50% of cancer deaths. Uh, so if you had, let's just say, I don't know, average family history or... You know, yeah, so if you're a person in whom, like, I don't know, average might be, yeah, my grandmother had breast cancer post-menopause um, and... I don't know, like my uncle had colon cancer when he was 70. Like that's probably about average, right? Yeah. I, you know, we could sort of, um, then I, you know, which is sort of like the, the boat I'm in, right? Like I'm pretty average risk for, for cancer. Um, but again, because philosophically my view is right now the best option we have for managing cancer is early detection because, mm -hmm. um, treatments, identical treatments have completely different outcomes based on the burden of disease. So treating early stage where you presumably only have like a couple billion cells produces a much better outcome than treating late stage where you have tens or hundreds of billions of cells based on the difference in mutations. So catching cancer early, very important and therefore I believe that the economic cost and the emotional cost of aggressive screening is warranted. But I don't, you know, I, I make sure people understand that, right? I make sure people understand what the false positive rates are and what the positive and negative predictive value is of these tests. So one of the things that, again, I go through this in great detail in this course is really making sure people understand sensitivity, specificity, and how those interact with prevalence to then determine positive and negative predictive value because that's what you really care about right sensitivity and specificity don't mean anything to people what they care about is if i test positive how likely is it that i have this thing if i test negative how likely is it that i don't have this thing mm -hmm. that's what people want to know and you can't know that without knowing the sensitivity and specificity which are test specific and prevalence or pretest probability which is your particular risk of having the thing that's being tested for and the lower that prevalence is the bigger the misses on positive and negative predictive value in the context of a given sensitivity and specificity okay if you were to go back in time to I don't know, tell yourself what you knew now when you were 25 again, or even 20 when you said you would start, you know, modulating APOB potentially. What age would you start look, doing the actual screenings for cancer? I mean, again, I think for someone of average risk, I think you really want to start paying attention to this at 40. I think that's where you start to see the actuarial uptick in cancer deaths. Um, in fact, of all the chronic deaths, the, the horsemen, cancer is the dominant one until the last three decades of life. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, diabetes, metabolic disease, those are not generally killing people in their 40s and their 50s. That's when cancer of a chronic disease is killing. Now, cancer, sadly, or not sadly, it depends how one thinks about this, is not the, even the leading cause of death anymore for people in their 40s and 50s. Believe it or not, that has now, do you know what that is? You know what's the leading cause of death now? Well, I would have said ASCVD, but. In the 40s and 50s, it's accidental death, mm. of which opioid, opioid poisoning is number one. Jeez. Um, and in fact, when taken collectively, deaths of despair, so suicide, alcohol-related death, and opioid poisoning is the leading cause of death for, uh, I think right now it's probably people age 20 to 55. Damn. Yeah, that's really bad in Vancouver, especially, I bet, with the fentanyl crisis and whatnot. What is the average death age of somebody from ASCVD, like 60s? Oh, that's a very good question. So for people who do have a heart attack in their life, so if you take all the people who have had a heart attack in their life, if you're a man, 50% of the time, it occurs before 65. If you're a woman, a third of the time, it occurs before the age of 65. So that's also a very important feature where I think people, there's two things in that that are surprising. One is just how often these things occur in young people. But secondly, most people don't think of cardiovascular disease as a female disease. 
Um, and it's true that women have about a decade delay in disease progression. So on average, a 60 year old woman has, you know, the coronary arteries of a 70 year old man, probably due to estrogen, but lots of people have speculated a bunch of things. I think personally, estrogen is the best explanation for yeah, this. It's impact on lipid metabolism should not be overlooked. Yeah. Some have speculated like iron, you know, like less oxidative stress due oh, to yeah. lower yeah. iron and things like that. But, but you know, the short answer is I don't think we have a clear sense of what it is, but you know, you can't deny the actuarial data. It is what it is. But um, interestingly too, estrogen is like pro clotting and yet well it's it's pro clotting in an oral administration i don't think it's really pro thrombotic when it's transdermal is it well no not an application i mean like endogenous aromatization to an estradiol that is significantly higher than a man you oh would yes 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 yeah yeah i see what you're saying yeah. so during pregnancy yeah but i think if you take like if you take an estradiol level i don't know of like so if you don't use super physiologic estradiol, so, mm. so non-synthetic, non-super physiologic, so that takes out birth control pills, that takes out pregnancy, is, is the presence of estradiol prothrombotic at those levels? At physiologic in women, like that's the thing I don't know is I'm wondering if even in the presence of potential enhanced Mm. clotting you're still getting the cardioprotective effect that is significantly above that that even outweighs whatever risk that is like i'm just saying you know it may just be more in favor yeah. of highlighting how important this really is and potentially even highlighting why hrt in women is you know so heavily demonized unjustly yeah i mean that's a we could spend an hour on that topic um <laughs> I was planning on it, but I will brush over. Well, it it's, it's funny. Like, you know, <laughs> you, you mentioned at the outset, the book is comprehensive. And yet, I, you know, there are many things I did not write about in there because I simply didn't have the space. Yeah. There's, I don't write about HRT. I don't write about, you know, TRT. I don't, I don't write about, I don't write a lot about pharmacology, actually. It's comprehensive for the, all the base layers of natural living, I yeah. would say. Yeah, and that that that's that's sort of what I set out to do. Um, in in one version of the book, there was a there was an appendix, which was like, you know, oh my god, like, I mean, it would have been a t we ended up scrapping it, but it would have been like a two hundred page appendix on the you know fifteen most relevant molecules. Oh, dude, that was one of my questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I had that coming up. Exactly. It was, uh, I think you said it on Rogan too. It was, um, and we can circle circle back to it after we finish. It was uh, 20 most important drugs or supplements. And I was going to ask you to segregate it into top 10 subs and top 10 drugs. <laughs> so let's do that after you, uh, I think that's probably... I guess we're we're probably good on you know cancer screening based on family history you know cost yeah I didn't sort of things. cover like what the modes are so obviously you need some sort of endoscopy mm -hmm. right so you need to look at the esophagus the stomach the duodenum the colon so that's upper and lower endoscopy um, you need a skin exam um, if you're a woman you need a cervical exam. Um, so basically outside the body, there's no excuse for getting cancer where it's, where the cancer is visible from outside the body. Mm -hmm. Um, when you get to inside the body, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, MRI, Pernuvo is one particular example. I was thrilled to find out there's one in Vancouver. It's, it's like, the first one. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, something's actually by me. That's yeah. advanced. Yeah, yeah. Finally. Yeah, I used yeah. like I usually have to come here just to I had blood my work. I had my first Pernuvo scan in Vancouver in two thousand fifteen. Huh. Yeah. Cool. So um you know, MRI has a very, very high sensitivity, meaning it's like very good at seeing cancer if cancer is there. But MRI has abhorrent specificity, meaning it's seeing a lot of things that aren't cancer. Hmm. High specificity would mean knowing how to not detect something that's not there. Right. Um, but the Pernuvo scanner, because of its technology, improves the specificity 
uh, quite a bit over off the shelf MRI technology, but it's still far from perfect. And therefore I tell every patient who's going into that MRI probability of a false positive is pretty high here. Um, there's going to be some little incidental finding that's going to be nothing, but it's going to require us to chase it down and figure out what it is. And that might require doing another test. It might require doing nothing for six months and rescanning you. And, you know, I just, I wouldn't let anybody ever go into one of those tests without knowing that. Okay. So 40 years old for average risk is kind of when you'd want to start taking things seriously, not from a things that prevent cancer. Obviously you would have good, you know, metabolic health, do all the base stuff that would. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the most obvious things are not smoking and being in good metabolic health. Um, there's almost assuredly a relationship with air quality. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know how much control one has over that outside of choosing where they live. Um, but you could argue, well, you know, maybe getting um, a, a pollution meter outside your house and deciding, you know, Do you have we, one? I don't because Austin is actually, it's so windy here that like we just have great air quality. I did for a while, but there are like actually hardcore HEPA filters all over this place or something. No, in, in fact, um, but I looked at, there's actually a website that allows you to see everyone who's got a certain brand of this thing and it's looking at what the, PM 2.5s are. So you can see the PM 2.5 concentration all over your city and all over the country. Oh, wow. So after like scouring that for a while, I realized, okay, we're pretty lucky where we live. It's just a low air pollution area. And by the way, the only thing you would do with that is decide like on a high pollution day, maybe that's not the day I'm going to go out for a long exercise session or something like that. Hmm. Um, but I think really the bread and butter of cancer prevention in terms of manageable risk is, um, is smoking clearly. And then metabolic health, okay. obesity is the second, uh, highest quote unquote environmental trigger of cancer. So tangenting off of that, we get into some of the stuff that you do to dial that in. What is your current morning routine in a nutshell? Um, you know, get up, um, check my HRV. I use a device called, um, uh, I think it's called Morpheus. God, I don't even know Sick the name. name. Yeah. I think it's called Morpheus. So it's a, it's like a, it's a, it's a heart rate monitor that I put on in the morning and it asks me four questions. So how long did you sleep? So the, technically what I'm doing, the first thing is I'm, um, you know, getting out of bed and, uh, you know, getting my phone to check my eight sleep. That'll tell me, you know, what that's my, like, that's my mattress cooling thing. And my sleep. I got one, by the way. Yeah. They're fantastic. Love I've it. been using it for like four years now. I can't get enough of it. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I got my, my girlfriend to stoke to use it too. Cause we, I had the, you ring. sleep at different temperatures. And yeah. Yeah. A dramatically different preferred environment in the bed. So it's like, you know, yep. one side of the bed's like, lava on the other side's cold and yeah, yeah so my same with me mine's freezing <laughs> quick note from one of our sponsors eight sleep this is the most absurd innovative nonsensical piece of sleep tech i've ever used and like the the way i speak about this thing you can tell how enthusiastic i get about it i've been using it for a few months and my girlfriend indirectly by being in the bed too and we both love it it is an intelligent sleep system is what they call it and the reason it's so great is it tracks your sleep metrics without having to wear anything. So I used to have wearables that I'd have and my girlfriend didn't have any. So it was only me tracking my metrics, but this thing tracks both of ours separately without having to wear anything, which is sick. In addition, auto regulates temperature for both of you separately and wakes you up without jolting your partner out of sleep with a big alarm. Like this thing is all in one all-encompassing absurdity it like i've worn a lot of devices that track you know heart rate variability heart rate sleep quality you know latency rem deep your temperature etc which is really helpful like these devices are great and there's also these things like pads you can put on your bed to change the temperature to help you get uh to cool down to go to sleep but as far as i know like this is the only high quality device that does everything all in one you don't need to wear anything and it does it for you and your partner separately and it helps regulate and optimize both of your sleep so you know one of the biggest obstacles with sleep quality is temperature regulation and you need to cool down a few degrees to get to sleep and transition into a deep restful sleep and then as your body temperature rises as you wake up that would be ideal and it's kind of like 
the ebb and flow of your circadian rhythm, but often this gets disjointed and messed up when you have a partner who is, you know, runs a lot colder than you or vice versa. So like for me, where I set the temperature of my place, my girlfriend will be freezing her ass off and have to dress like it's, you know, we're in an igloo or some shit in order to stay warm. And then if she's comfortable and the temperature in the place is set to where she'd want it, then I'm, you know, sweating my bag off and I need to be like, no covers on, just in my boxers, and I'm sweating even if it's basically winter time. So, unreal device. I can't say enough good things about it. If you want to check it out, use the link in the description below and use code MPMD at checkout to save $200 on your pod. It might be the most expensive piece of tech I have in my place, actually, but in my opinion, it's absolutely worth it. Like, you cannot put a price on your health, quality of life, or your partners. And if you can enhance both of those to any meaningful degree, I personally would say it's probably worth it. You know, alongside nutrition, exercise, sleep is like the lowest hanging fruit of modifiable lifestyle factors that can really change your life when optimized. So you can get their full mattress or their pod cover. Me, I went with the pod cover through my research prior to getting one. It looks like the pod cover actually had just as reliable tracking of metrics and auto regulation. So that was relieving for me because I didn't want to buy, you know, some brand new mattress, have to figure out what to do with my current one. I actually like my current mattress. So being able to get a pod cover that would just wrap nicely around my current bed. Awesome. If you guys end up trying it, you know, I really hope you like it as much as I do and your significant other, if they're in the bed too, um, also loves it as much as mine does. I think it's pretty fucking awesome. So that's it, and back to our regularly scheduled programming. So anyway, so I check my eight sleep, I get my sleep data, I basically, the app says, how long did you sleep last night? What was the quality of the sleep? How sore are you? And there's a scale, and how do you feel? And they might sound like really soft questions, but those are actually highly validated questions that are used by trainers, along with heart rate, historically morning resting heart rate, to track readiness for exercise. Then you put this device on your wrist. It's just a heart rate monitor, uh, wrist, uh, like on a forearm monitor, and it just measures your heart rate while you lay there still for two and a half minutes. And then it tells you your heart rate and heart rate variability. So then with the heart rate, heart rate variability, and those four inputs I gave, it tells me my heart rate zones for the day. And um, it also just kind of gives me a sense. And I've been using this device for like five months now, or maybe six months. And I check it every day with my actual performance metrics and with lactate levels. So I wouldn't say it's perfect, but I have been very impressed with how well it predicts my cardio performance because every day it gives me different zones to train in. Mm. And w if I use the top of it just puts them into three zones, right? So like zone one, two, and three. But if I use the bridge between one and two, that heart rate as my target heart rate, it tracks very closely to lactate and RPE levels for workouts. Anyway, long tangent, but that's like the first thing I do. What's your resting heart rate? Um, eh, It's like 40, I don't know, I think it was 47 this morning. So I know a lot of people, or at least I used to think too, that only once you get, tachycardic do you end up with you know worrisome resting heart rate you know concerns but it seems like the data shows that for every increment of some you know seemingly insignificant amount but it's actually not you have a significantly increased likelihood of dying do you could you speak to that data at all and like what I don't, i'm not familiar you're saying on resting heart rate the more you're the higher your resting heart rate the less fit you are yeah i mean I, the data that i'm more familiar with are the heart rate recovery data mm. um so and i can't quote these numbers off the top of my head although i did a podcast on this an ama four or five months ago but the worse the heart rate recovery that's a huge predictor of mortality in fact i would say of all metrics resting heart rate hrv which is highly genetic, by the way, and heart rate recovery, which is very trainable. Um, heart rate recovery is a huge predictor. So, so you said HRV is very genetic. So what, if somebody has a low genetic, somebody has a very low HRV, like, you know, you, you know, like, and it depends. I mean, again, I think there's a lot of devices out there that are just garbage. I used to use a device called first beat, which was like a Finnish company. It was like an EKG based device. Um, that thing, you know, was measuring HRV very accurately. And if you're, you know, there's a real, there's a genetic difference between somebody who's 20 and who's hundred on HRV. It's just, there's, there's no two ways about it. And it's not to say that you can't move yours up or down by 
you know, some amount. A person who at 20, if they fully optimize, might get to 30. Um, but they're ne I just, I've never seen an example of where that person's going to go from 20 to 100. And how significant of an impact is that on? The literature suggests that there's a sizable increase in risk of cardiovascular disease if HRV is below about 17 milliseconds. But again, I, I think it's very important that people understand that that's HRV measured on an EKG, hmm. which is really like the gold standard for measuring HRV. And I think you just have to be very careful with wearables. Is um, there like a target benchmark like i know it's highly variable if it's genetic but i mean no i think what you want to do is get a sense of what your hrv is and just work to have it higher and and and, and really understand what makes it lower like oh like my hrv is lower if i eat food before bed mm. my hrv is lower if i drink alcohol my hrv is lower if the room is hot my hrv is lower if i'm overtrained okay so, so, you, so you get up, you check this. Uh, yeah, so I, I sort of get, I get that data. Um, I, uh, you know, do you and your wife compete each, with each other on the eight sleep stuff? No, she couldn't care less. <laughs> so she's okay. yeah, yeah. She's <laughs> she's not. Isn't into it crazy how contrasting significant others can be? Where it's like you could be like the foremost expert on fill in the blank, and your girlfriend or wife just doesn't give a fuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like my family, I try and. You know, they're looking online for random blogs on hormones and stuff. I'm just like, what? Like, Talk to me. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, anybody I work with or, like, defer to me in something. And then I'll find them reading some obscure, like, weird vegan doctor telling about something. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So um, so then we have coffee. And, um, you know, we have a dog now. So we'll, we'll take him out. And, um, yeah, just kind of putts around. Our boys are up at six. So, yeah, the morning is... Um, well, and then I got to drive my daughter to band. So, um, so that's at six 30. I got to do that. So I'm usually back from that by seven and then the boys got to go to school. Um, and then I usually go and I will either shoot the bow and arrow or get in the simulator. Uh, oh, and by the way, in there I've returned like urgent emails. So somewhere like I've figured out a chance to get all urgent emails address so so there's another like 30 minutes in there of doing bullshit work uh and then i'll i'll sort of shoot the bow and arrow or drive the simulator and then i'll work out um shower and then kind of eat my first meal outside of the coffee mm -hmm. um and it's almost always like venison um and some nuts or something like that and then once my day starts, I'm pretty much nonstop till 5 p.m. Or I'm trying to actually break that and get out at about 4.30, um, which actually makes a big difference to end a half hour sooner. So maybe, ha so s finishing somewhere between four and five and not really breaking for a meal, except if I can wrap up a call a little bit early, I'll sneak out and have like a salad with some protein or just get some more venison, basically. I'm kind of eating venison most of the day. So the, the actual hardcore work period starts at what time again uh somewhere between 10 30 and 11 till about five that's interesting how much stuff you do during your first hours before you sit down and really dig in well i mean i think there's a look i pay i mean there's a the, the luxury i have for being able to only have to sit for six hours in a day to work is first of all i mean there's the price i pay to have that luxury is I have to be working outside of business hours too. Like mm -hmm. I still have to do work in the morning. I still have to do a bit of work in the evening. I do quite a bit of work on the weekends. And during my go time, there's like, you know, I feel I'm fortunate that I'm able to really focus on my work. Like I'm not someone who gets distracted easily. So I can be a laser during that time. Um, but um, yeah, so then usually at the end of the day, you know, sort of like what we're going to do today, I go for a ruck. So It'll either just be straight ruck or like a lot of times I'll do other exercises. So we'll do like some rope sl smashes and, you know, just do something else. I like also one of my favorite things to do is do like farmer carries in the driveway and that kind of stuff. And then go out and do um, a good ruck, come back, do a cold plunge after the ruck, make dinner, have dinner, put the kids to bed, you know, hang out with my wife, sauna do a little bit of work or usually do a little bit of work before sauna, actually sauna, 
and then go to bed. So rucking, what is it exactly? It is walking around with a heavy backpack on your back. Okay. And how how many steps do you typically do for a ruck or do you even count? Do you just go like some distance yeah. based on how you feel or? A... Yeah. Okay. It's it's like, it's about, you know, an hour. That's okay. the route I do. Huh. Nice. Lots of hills. Um, you know, different times of year. There's a, like, you're definitely a lot slower in the summer in Austin because oh, you know, it's, yeah. it's it over. It's like it's you over. already have a backpack on when you step outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, when it's over 100 degrees, you, you really, it's really hard. Um, in the winter, I actually find it a lot less enjoyable in the winter because it's not as hard. Mm. And, uh, you know, you make up for it by going faster. You just try to go as fast. You know, in the, in the summer, just going at a reasonable speed is, is enough of a burden. And, and, and I'll do different weights. So sometimes I'll do kind of a, a lighter weight and go a lot quicker. And sometimes I'll do a heavier weight and just do hill repeats and obviously go slower. Hmm. Nice. What weight have you worked up to? Um, I rarely go above 80 pounds. I think, um, you know, obviously I can go significantly higher if I want to, but I think 80, I think 50 to 80 is the sweet spot for me, um, where, you know, I can go fast enough and I'm also not fatiguing due to the actual pack being on my back. Right. Like, okay. you know, it's not, it's not so uncomfortable to have the pack on my back. And I don't think, you know, I don't feel like I'm putting myself at increased risk, but you know, it's important to understand like your body is being taxed a lot by that weight. Um, and any imperfections, which I have many in your gait are going to be amplified. So, you know, you're, you're going to feel it more in your feet. You're going to feel, and I, you know, fortunately my gait's not so bad that it translates into actual injuries, but if, you know, given that I'm very attentive to this kind of stuff, like, uh, you know, oh, my, you know, my, my flexor halysis longus is feeling a little bit inflamed today because of, you know, how much I'm really having to make my foot work to carry that load. And is that like your primary cardio that you do? For no, my primary cardio is on the bike. So all that work, all my workouts get done in the morning. So the, yeah. the morning is when I'm going to lift, do my cardio, you know, and then the, this is like kind of a bonus form of exercise. Okay. Nice. So when you get to, you know, so it's like two meal. Well, you have like four meals a day, don't you typically, or you split up your protein? I just split up protein. I'm just kind of doing like 40, 40 gram, 40 to 50, 50 gram boluses of protein via venison throughout the day. But, um, yeah, I'll probably have like two meals a day, like a sort of like lunch, like we had today. And then a dinner like we'll have you know mm -hmm. we're, and 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 you know i'm kind of a simpleton with food like i'm as long as you hit your protein you're good yeah and and also like i'm not like i don't mind eating the same thing all the time right like you know tonight we're gonna have some sort of you know we're just gonna be it's like gonna be a salad and protein basically yeah um and i just it's very easy for me to rotate the proteins i mean i i, I can eat the same thing almost every day do you count calories too, i don't just... right now i mean r right right now is sort of I would argue my diet is good in quality, bad in quantity. So I'm, you know, clearly 10 pounds over where I would be ideally. And it's, it's all just caloric surplus that I'm not making any effort to, to cut. You say clearly like you're visibly fat or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, well, <laughs> you've definitely packed on a lot of muscle in the past few years though. And presumably that reflects your stance on... I don't know. It's less fasting. Yeah. I mean, I don't fast anymore. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that was, I had, I had definitely lost a lot of weight overall, including lean mass by 2019, 2020. So making that shift from, you know, the aggressive fast, the super longevity stuff to more like a hybrid angle was there, like, what was the catalyst for that, if anything? I think there were two. The first was I had a DEXA scan in 2020 and I was blown away because I've been tracking. I, I used to get DEXAs like every six months going back to 2011. Mm -hmm. And I have them all in a spreadsheet. And I just couldn't believe how much lean mass I had lost in between 20. 15 and 2020, hmm. um, 20 pounds of lean mass, I think yeah. I'd lost. And so my body fat went up 
God, I can't remember the exact numbers. I covered this in a, in an AMA at one point when I went over body comp stuff, but I, I feel like my body fat went from 9% to 14% accompanied by a loss of 20 pounds of lean mass. Um, so that was part of it. I was like, eh, that's not the phenotype I want. The second thing truthfully became, um, when I stopped traveling so much because I used to do these very long fasts and it was very easy to do that when I had an apartment in New York because, and I used to be in New York two weeks a month, Ooh. right? So I was there, you know, not quite half the time because it didn't exactly work out to that, but I was there often enough that like, I mean, it was easy for me to do all my fasting there. And it's just, it was perfectly easy to control my food environment. Whereas when you're at home and you're fasting, it, it's very difficult to do when you have kids. Like it's very difficult to do when you have a social circle. Yeah, it's, it's hard your to family. do when you just have a pantry by your office. Yeah, although I think there's something about it when when you're by yourself, like you can sort of do anything. I Because mm -hmm. I had a pantry in New York, right? But the difference is I didn't have, to, there was nobody that was looking at me to eat. Right. Whereas if you're, if you have a family, like it's hard to sit at the table with everybody and not eat. Yeah. Um, so, so I think those are the two things that happened to coincide was my absolute cessation of travel and, um, and then that, you know, that DEXA scan just being, you know, not what I wanted to see. Did you notice a significant uptick in natural hormone levels like IGF-1 test, et cetera, when you... No, I was sort of surprised that, uh, you know, I used to always do a blood draw pre and post long fast. So when I was doing like seven day fasts, I would always just do a blood draw right before and right after. And those were very interesting because those are profound changes, right? So yeah, when you- use your test 13,000%, right? Fasting. <laughs> yeah. Who was this woman that says this? I don't know. Yeah, it was, uh, I think she conflated the growth hormone spike you get from fasting and extrapolated it from some really obscure literature. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, I saw the exact opposite. I mean, my testosterone would plummet into the toilet after a seven-day fast. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my TSH would go through the roof. My reverse T3 would go through the roof. My free T3 would go through the floor. Mm -hmm. So you're profoundly hypothyroid. I mean, your ratio of free T3 to reverse T3, um, you know, you really want to see that ratio below about 0.2. Um, you know, mine would go, I don't know, from like 0.12 to 0.5 or something. I mean, it was insane. Do you have like a target TSH? for people no i think symptoms matter a lot more so i used to be much more kind of fixated on tsh really needs to be between about 0.5 and 2 and if it's outside of that range you got to look for a reason to do something that and now i'm kind of like look if a person's tsh is four and they have no discernible you know, they don't have antibodies. They don't have any discernible issues that you could associate with hypothyroidism, by the way, including dyslipidemia, which shouldn't be treated until you correct underlying hypothyroidism. Um, I'm, I'm much less interested in trying to treat quote unquote subclinical hypothyroidism. Question about diet. I know bodybuilders use Cytomel like it's going out of oh, style. Yeah. And it's like indiscriminate in the tissue. It is catabolic too, seemingly. So they will... Even I've seen people lose seemingly, you know, a decent amount of lean muscle, even on pretty significant amounts of anabolics with pushing 75 micrograms of T3 to try and get shredded it, it, for it, bodybuilding. It, it's amazing to me that a human could consume 75 micrograms <laughs> of yeah. T3. Um, Dude, you should see yes. some of the fat loss stacks. It's like clen, 120 micrograms. So you're literally shaking. So you're burning calories at rest just by shaking more. So your NEAT is way up. Then you're using Cytomel to crank your, you know, thyroid, active thyroid hormone through the roof. You are using, some people use DNP, which is like an explosive. And it basically- That's the, that increases thermogenesis in the liver, doesn't it? It increases whole body thermogenesis to where if you overdose on it, you can melt your organs, essentially. Mm. Um, yeah, some of the shit's nuts. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that they use. <laughs> Yeah, and that's on top of the, the growth hormone too because you got to get the extra lipolysis and take advantage of it during your fasted cardio and a lot of stuff. But um, 
anyway, we should definitely uh, dig back into that stuff at some point. The pharmacology is really interesting too. Some of the stuff that was totally pulled is. out and why it's used. Like the when you dig into Clen and realize that people are intentionally making themselves twitch to burn calories and you can get an eke out another couple hundred a day or more. It's pretty wild. And it really fucks up your resting heart rate, but it's good if you're cutting. Diet for young growing boys who burn a lot of calories. You mentioned you ate 6,000 plus calories when you were younger and you were doing, you know, a ton of activity. And presumably some of those calories had to come from hyper palatable or calorie dense foods. There was absolutely no effort whatsoever to eat like a quality diet. Like we didn't, I, it did like that just wasn't on my radar. Like what's the most egregious common meal that you would eat? In terms of, just I mean, like junkness. I, I, I mean, look. I would every morning my breakfast was a box of cereal in one of those large Tupperware bowls. You know, the bowl <laughs> that you could wear as a hat. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know, like, like life cereal with chocolate. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, like the stuff you would make chocolate milk with. So I would have yeah. the bowl of life cereal covered with a chocolate sauce. So I'm eating a, bo a box of life cereal in chocolate milk, um, or Fruit Loops, or Captain Crunch, or whatever. Um, you know, lunch would be my six sandwiches or seven sandwiches. So the whole loaf of bread turned into full, like each one is now a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> um, plus I'm eating like French fries covered in gravy, like whatever they serve in the cafeteria that I can scarf down in between workouts. Um, for, you know, I would drink two liters of orange juice for lunch or Damn. two liters of apple juice. <laughs> um, I mean, there was just, it, there, there was no limit. Like I could eat anything. Like I could eat anything. I could eat a gallon of ice cream in one sitting. Like I was unfazed by it. And it was still, I was just always on the cusp of keeping my body weight. Mm. Like I was, it's funny, I'm very meticulous. So throughout all of high school, I weighed myself every single day at the gym after the morning workout every single time. And I went back and looked at some of these data a while ago. Like, I don't think I ever deviated lower than 157 or higher than one. 59 for like a three-year period yeah i think a lot of people would be shocked they often say you can't outwork a bad diet but i've seen it for no no, no you totally can and i used to say that stupidly until i realized of course you can when you're young enough yeah. and you have the capacity for that much work but i trained six hours a day mm. like that's the reality of it is like if you're will and, but here's the thing like i couldn't do one week of what I did for four years. Like I couldn't do it. I physically wouldn't be able to recover from one of the days that I used to do like it was nothing. So one of the, the question I have stemming from that is as a father of growing children, you obviously are mindful of, to some extent, what they're putting in their bodies presumably, and at least at some level of oversight, hoping they're getting enough nutrients into maximize growth potential, I would think. So I've seen seemingly like I've seen people who take health advice online and extrapolate it out to children too. They have them fasting, doing ketogenic diets, stuff like this, which is not really pro, you know, anabolic or even just like pro getting to your put height potential, maybe even. So in young children, you know, like maybe one day I'll have kids. What kind of advice would you have for, I don't know, eating patterns and how you, because obviously what you just described was like an obscene diet by any standard for quality, but it was necessary to satisfy energy intake relative to output. Now, obviously not every kid's going to be reflecting the exact same extreme stuff you did, but at some level, there is a reasonable demand, presumably, that exceeds, you know, what many, I don't know, adults may think their kids need to maximize growth and also be no, healthy. It's, it's, it's a good question. And, and honestly, I don't think I know the answer because of exactly what you just said, which is because I just energy worry that balance some people is a, might uh, yeah. restrict their kids because they want them to only eat good food. And it sounds so paradoxical, like, oh, let your kids eat shitty. Not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's some level of in-between where if they aren't going to have the palatable options that may otherwise satisfy the nutrient demands of their, like, the velocity of growth, you may otherwise be hindering them by restricting them to what you deem to be the healthiest diet. Yeah. Um, 
the, the challenge, as you say, even when treating kids with obesity is you can't treat an obese kid the way you treat an obese adult if the kid is still growing. Mm. You have to be more judicious in your calorie restriction because you still have to allow them to try to become anabolic in one regard, even as you try to make them be catabolic in another, or at least stable in fat mass while they gain lean mass. Mm. So I pretend to have absolutely zero expertise here. This would be an example of me not being an ultra crepidarian. Um, so the only thing I can really speak to is how I think about my kids, right? So, you know, my kids are, you know, fortunately, you know, not overweight, not obese, healthy, you know, whatever, normal kids, right? So um, mostly I'm just trying to make sure that they eat healthy food um, but also I'm very cognizant of the fact that if you go too far, you're going to potentially create a pattern of behavior that could backfire later on. So I think a lot of people would be very shocked to know how much crap my kids do eat. Like, yeah, that's why I'm almost bringing it up. Cause I feel like a lot of people assume, especially, you know, I know you don't want to be a ultra crepidarian, but many would consider your opinion to be relatively, you know, uh, they would take it pretty seriously for... Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, if, if my kids... Like, my kids probably eat a burger and fries every week, right? There's zero chance they're not doing that. They're probably mm -hmm. having pizza every week. They're eating ice cream a couple times a week. Like, they're eating... And, and by the way, this is sometimes still a, source of tension, still a source of tension between me and my wife. Although, in truth, I think the real tension is that I hate eating that stuff. And if they eat it, I eat it. Mm -hmm. So I think where the tension probably comes... And my wife and I had a little tiff about this the other day is like she had a whole box of those like drumstick ice cream things in the freezer mm -hmm. and they're for the boys right and the yeah. boys eat like one every third day or something and i had like three of them in one day <laughs> and as i was like and you know she's kind of like well you should have better self-control and i'm like i don't have self-control like that's my whole mo in life is default food environment <laughs> yeah. make the default environment good and yeah. then i don't have to exercise self-control so so like we're having this you know argument about this and in the end, what does it come down to? Well, it comes down to, I think the compromise is, look, how about we go out for junk food and we just don't have junk food here? Can, like, can we agree that we don't need like every flavor of ice cream in our freezer for the odd time our kid wants ice cream? And by the way, if they had their way, they'd get it every day, but it's a treat. So it's not every mm -hmm. day. Um, I don't know that I'm answering the question, but. No, yeah, I think it's great seeing or, you know, hearing that you have a more hybrid approach to it. It's not just this myopic, you know, you guys need to eat a grass fed steak every meal and, you know, hit your micronutrients <laughs> and, you know, it's the healthiest thing on the planet. Because I feel like we're pretty lucky in that our kids, maybe just through osmosis, like they're used to eating good food. Like, you're gonna have a big fat salad, steak, salmon, venison, elk, baked potatoes, mm. rice. Like they eat real food. And I think in part that's because their parents both love cooking. So maybe the most important lesson here is learning how to cook. Learn how to cook. <laughs> like seriously, yeah. I think if 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 I think there's a lot of evidence for people, you know, people knowing how to cook have lower obesity, right? Now there's yeah. a bunch of confounders there, but I also think like if you're going to go to the trouble of cooking, you're just going to make better quality food. And so fortunately, whether it's mom cooking or dad cooking, our kids are always getting a really good home cooked meal. And that's the way if, you know, when they're like, oh, we really want to go out for burgers. It's like, okay, fine. We'll go out for burgers and it's a treat, but it's not like, that's not the daily norm. Mm -hmm. And, or like we have friends like, who order food in every single night. And I I think if you did that, it would be a lot harder to eat well. Where is the best burger in Austin? Well, that's a good question. You know, Philip Franklin Lee order, uh, opened a place, and I'm blanking on the name of it though. Shoot. Um, it's I've only been there once. Actually, Andrew Huberman and I went there one night and um, it was pretty amazing. So, so if you, but I can't remember the name of it. It's kind of a weird name. How long ago was that? seven or eight months ago. I think he opened it last October. You guys are still able to go out in public and like go to normal places without getting bombarded? I never, nobody, I mean, if I get recognized two or three times a day, that's a lot. Oh. Yeah, Andrew's probably different. Yeah. So 
one thing I did want to talk about, like this brings us to nighttime, I guess, after you've ate dinner. Do you have a specific cutoff when you stop eating to prevent it from hindering sleep or? I, I don't, but again, very fortunate in that when, like this is one of the perks of having young kids is like we're kind of eating early, you know, like, mm. you know, if we have dinner at 5.30 or 6, we won't today because obviously it's a bit of a later day, but um, I definitely do not want to be eating after 7. 7.30. That would be really late. Mm -hmm. um, now, maybe once a week, it's going to go beyond that. If I go out for dinner, like my wife and I try to go out for dinner once a week for date night, and that could end up being a bit later, but not much. Like It'd be very unusual that I'm eating after 7.30. And then one of the things I do is I immediately brush my teeth after dinner, which is so dumb, but it's such an easy way for me to not eat after. That's a good hack. Yeah. Just brush your you teeth. Add an extra layer of guilt. If and you just you just add like I can't tell you the number of times I yeah. still want to go and grab a handful of nuts out of the pantry, but I'm like, oh, I already brushed my teeth. And for me, it's like a big ordeal because it's like it's two minutes of the automated thing plus the flossing and the whole thing. It's like that's like another three minutes. And also just I don't want to have to do it again. Yeah. So, yes, by eat by brushing my teeth right after dinner, that really caps my last meal. Isn't it crazy how fast your brain can shift from saying I'm done eating to completely convincing yourself otherwise 20 minutes later yeah yeah especially for me i mean i have a ravenous appetite by the way that is i think there were two things about my past that because my boys always say they're like dad how do you eat so fast and i'm like i know it sucks like i think it's a big part of like my struggle with eating is i eat really really fast and you know i think I developed really bad eating habits growing up, eating so much. Have like you ever I ever heard, I'm sure you've heard it and I don't know how factual it is. It's like eat twice as slow and then it makes you fill up faster. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so cups I'm assuming so if, that if, hasn't worked. I, well, I mean, no, I just don't do it. I just, I'm not disciplined <laughs> enough. I just, yeah. I, and I said, but which gets to the second point, which is I think during my residency, you really learn to eat quickly. Like mm. when you're wearing a trauma pager, and right, right. the second it goes off, you're done with whatever you're doing. Like you just learn to inhale food. And so you take this, you know, hard wiring from many, many years of just never stop eating, eat to the point where you're full and then keep eating. Cause that's basically what I had to do to not lose weight. And you hardwire that in and then couple it with like the speed eating Olympic champion. And then today, you know, it's like, there's no need for you to eat that much or eat that fast, but. Do you think there's anything to be said about eating huge quantities of food and stomach volume, like expansion as a result? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I assume you mean permanent expansion. Yeah, like, yeah, I would assume it would be flexible enough that it could just accommodate whatever, but. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, hmm. not, I'm not sure. So you get to bed and you have, uh, you know, a pretty dialed in routine based on the book. Is there a way you could you know, summarize, like obviously you get into more of the nuance around the impact light has and how problematic it can be, the different types, but just at a high level, what are kind of like the lowest hanging fruit things that you must have satisfied, or even when you're traveling, how do you dial it in? Well, um, definitely room light and room temperature. People always ask me like, oh, do you keep your phone in your room? And it's like, I wouldn't dream of keeping my phone in my room because like, I really don't like the thing. Like, it's just not a device that I like. Um, and I also know how easy it is to look at and how bright it is and how stimulating it is. And so I don't even keep my work phone near me for the last three hours I'm awake or maybe the last two hours that I'm awake for sure. Like I use a different, I have two phones, right? So I have one phone that is my regular phone and then I have one that's called my bat phone. And that one has no email on it, no social media, nobody knows the phone number. The only reason I basically have it is it's got music, it's got podcasts. So I listen to music or a podcast in the sauna. It has, um, uh, it has a calendar on it. So if I'm going out for dinner, I could take it and I could still see where I need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got a camera. So it's like I can take pictures. Obviously, you know, it's an iPhone. But other than that, it's like a totally useless thing, which is perfect. Oh, and it has the remote for our whole like entertainment system. So that's the other reason why I'd have it if I'm watching TV or something. But again, it's really good that I don't have to have my phone with me because actually I think that it's not even so much the light from the phone that is the problem. 
it's more the stimulation from the phone and it's yeah. more that it kind of gets your brain kind of cranking and yeah like seeing all the emails that have piled up the texts social media notifications it's all like stimulates your i don't know sympathetic nervous tone perhaps and just gets you kind of like oh my god look how much stuff is here yeah i also get anxious when i have even my phone on airplane mode even if it's by me i think about all the stuff that's going to flood in right when i turn it off airplane mode so i have to have it completely out in a different room maybe i should get a burner phone that sounds like a good idea i think the bad phone is so key i love it yeah and it's a great it's great if i take my kids out because I want to have a phone just because we are kind of neat, you know, you want your map or you want to be able to make a phone call, but, and my wife and my daughter know the number. So like they can get a hold of me anytime they want, but it's, it's also a great way to encourage being present, which is, is hard. You know, I think it's hard for everybody. It's certainly hard for me. And it's really easy if I should be doing, you know, something that matters to be looking at a phone that's kind of chirping at me. Yeah. No, that's something I, did want to ask you about too is i found i really enjoyed your podcast with bill perkins and talking about you know actually being happy living in the moment some of those principles because it's you know at, when you are a hard driving entrepreneur type you often you know end up very much just living for what is the next the next milestone and next thing you're striving for and it becomes pretty hard to ground yourself and really absorb what's going on in real time and it's like it's like a, a skill to try and be able to enjoy life sometimes yeah bill bill and i have become friends and um yeah i think that would be definitely one of the podcasts i would recommend people go back and listen to i uh yes yeah, you just go to the drive and search bill perkins uh and, and i would recommend reading his book to die with zero uh so so die with zero amazing book and, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of lessons there around the tragedy of forgetting what we're doing it for. And, yeah. you know, you know, I did something recently, uh, for my birthday, my 50th, my wife wanted to have a party and I was like, I didn't want to have a party because even if you have all your closest people at the party, you're you're not going to spend meaningful time with them, right? Your job is going, making the rounds, seeing everybody, but I want to be able to spend actual time with people. So instead I said, look, I want you to ask my friends for a very specific thing that they want to do with me in the next five years. And I don't care what it is, like we're, it's going to happen. And this was amazing. So she did this and I got like a 90 minute video of the clips of all my friends saying, all right, like, I really want to go and hike Machu Picchu. And it's like, okay, we have, and I'm like literally putting a spreadsheet together of how to manage doing all of this stuff in the next five years. But, you know, a lot of that really came from this, this, this discussion from, from Bill, which is like, you don't wait, you know, like I'm, I'm the king of deferred stuff, but you know, I am 50 years old. I can do anything physically. This is the time to do exactly you know, all of these things, uh, and share in these memories with people and not wait until, okay, you know, one more milestone, one more milestone or whatever. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, the last chapter of your book in particular too, is very powerful. And a lot of people, I don't think will expect, you know, the very candid discussion or even that you had these issues and a lot of people, you know, read it for themselves to get granular on it. But, you know, my interpretation, and this is, I try to take what I can from people who are already successful and have achieved great things. And then more often than not, I see patterns and try and extrapolate out, okay, if I'm, you know, 20 years older, do I foresee myself having the same uh, epiphany about, you know, if I was 30, how to maybe tangent my life differently to kind of, you know, be able to appreciate the moment, et cetera. And when do you think that I don't know, that pivot for you where it became less about, I don't know, accolades on a piece of paper or achievements in life, maybe even from a financial perspective, et cetera, like going towards experiences, I don't know, getting, uh, just being grateful for where you're at in life and being able to live in the moment more. If you were to go back in time, like, would you have done things differently earlier or what are your biggest takeaways from 
like I know you've kind of arrived at a much better place based on where you're at, which is amazing. But if you could go back, is there anything you would have changed earlier? And if so, what? I think it's always hard to to think through those because pending there's no butterfly effect. Well, yeah, the butterfly effect is is is. But even if you discount the butterfly effect, um, I think that um, you know sometimes these things are just difficult because you really have to, okay, so let's play this out. So there's a time machine and I get to go back and I get to talk to 20 year old Peter. Let's, huh. yeah, cause it's tough. Cause then obviously you might not have your kids around or what. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I would say, I don't think 20 year old Peter was willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anything, including that spoken by 50 year old Peter could really move the needle. Now, Maybe he'd say, wait, you really are me. And if I could somehow convince him that I am you, I am the ghost of Christmas future, and this is what is in store for you. Yeah. And if you just do X, Y, and Z, now you're going to save yourself and others a lot of pain. Um, you know, that would have been fantastic. But then the flip side is like, yeah, I just... I don't know. I don't spend that much time. I guess instead of re trying to think about what you might have changed, what advice would you have for somebody who's potentially on the path where they are heavily financially oriented, entrepreneurial driven, you know, putting off experiences for the, you know, current goals that are on their plates? Presumably you can relate fairly significantly. Sure. And, and, and I, but I also don't want to represent that I don't still struggle with those things. I mean, I, you know, I was texting with a good friend of mine this morning about like, you know, uh, you know, sort of a, how I'm thinking about the next decade. And part of it is like time is the most precious commodity. And there are a lot of things I still am not able to do because of how many commitments I've made. Like, I still mm -hmm. think I'm working way harder than I should be. I still think I work much harder than I need to be. And at least I'm cognizant of that. And at least I'm taking steps to mitigate that. But, and I'm putting up guardrails to prevent it from becoming unmanageable. But I don't think I've reached a place of appropriate balance yet. I, I don't think that, you know, I don't think I'm optimizing even fully in the in the place of of experience, despite being you know two orders of magnitude better than I was five or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. I still think I have a long way to go. So, and I think you know guys like Bill Perkins, um, you know, help me think about that stuff. And uh, and 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 doing something like I did with this birthday wish is a really great forcing function because seeing what these obligations are now. And when I say obligations, it's not a hard thing. It's like these amazing things that I can't wait to do with these friends of mine. I realized like, Peter, you really have to change the landscape of how your life is scheduled. Mm -hmm. And so actually one of the things I did last week was sit down with my, uh, my assistant and my COO and come up with um, like 10 new rules for how my life gets scheduled. And it's going to be hard. Like it's going to be, it, we're going to create much more rigor around what I do and what I say no to and all in the spirit of trying to make more time. Because the other thing that I really think about, it's not just my own health. It's like, I only really have 10 more years until my kids are all gone. And I think that's actually the thing that probably worries me more than being 60. Mm -hmm. It's you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'll be a healthy 60 year old and then I'll still be able to do most of what I can do today. The difference is my kids won't be under the roof and we won't, you know, I won't see them every day. That's actually a far bigger concern. Understood. No, that's, uh, you know, I try to take what I can. I don't have kids yet, but maybe someday. So what I, Great, I greatest thing in the world. Yeah. I mean, it truly is like, I just, I would, again, it's one of those things like, you know, I, I never wanted to have kids. I didn't like it. It struck me as a bad idea. Actually, it was like an impediment to my goals. It was a financial impediment, uh, a time impediment. I just didn't, 
Like it just didn't, I didn't, it didn't register to me as something that would make any sense. Um, and now I look back and I, I really, I, I think in some ways I almost feel the, the opposite, which is like, I almost struggle to imagine for me meaning without kids. Would you have had them earlier pending your current stance? Um, because I think I am in a similar boat to exactly what you just described is I think of those things, but it's. And you're 30? Yeah. My interpretation too is that a lot of people who think they don't want them or those reasons you laid as, you know, underpinnings change their mind pretty significantly or are convinced like wildly opposite after the fact, seemingly. <laughs> Yeah. I, I also think that having kids is hard and I don't think it's for everyone. And I don't think the world needs more kids that have suboptimal parents. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I also, I always want to be very careful that I'm not preaching like everybody should have kids. And if you don't have kids, your life doesn't have, no, I don't believe that at all. I, I can only speak for myself. I would be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be here if I didn't have kids truthfully. And I never could have fathomed what what it would mean to me to have kids and how much it matters to, again, just my sense of like what, what matters in the universe. Um, so would I have had them earlier? It's hard because all things equal. Sure. Like I wish, I wish so. But, but the problem is if I had them sooner and I was the same guy that I was, then it would have been a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's actually better that I had them later because, you know, I, it gave. How old were you when you had the first? Uh, I was 35 when my daughter was born. Okay. Yeah. So I got some runway. Yeah. A little bit. So circling back to the top 10 supplements and drugs, taking a hard detour back here. So you said you were going to include it um, and didn't make it into the book. What are the top 10? Yeah, and, and top 10. Well, yeah, I think it would be like the, the ones that I would be asked about the most. So it's sure. not like these are the things that you should be taking. It's like, what are what would be the top 10 molecules worth understanding or something like that? So, I mean, I think it, it would have certainly been statins, hmm. PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, metformin, rapamycin, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, testosterone, HRT for women, so estrogen, progesterone, growth hormone, allopurinol probably would have been thrown in there, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So those would have been kind of your top 10-ish pharmaceutical, like prescription-based exogenous molecules. Again, meaning where I really want a reader to understand in a very nuanced way the ins and outs of those drugs. And, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few in there, but that's like ballpark. You know, that's kind of like disease specific management, gyro protection, you know, across the board, right? On the supplement side, I think the ones that I would have um, ultimately finished would have been EPA and DHA, um, Theracumin, vitamin D, ashwagandha, L3 and 8 with magnesium. Uh, B vitamins in general. God, what else was on my list? I don't remember what else we had in there. But, you know, like, again, nothing like, oh, creatine for sure. Um, CoQ10? No, I don't think I was going to do something on CoQ10. Yeah, I'm sure I'm blanking on some really obvious ones that I'm forgetting that were kind of like interesting that I enough that I thought like I want to make sure people have some understanding of the data. Like, what's the mechanism of action? And we have kind of a framework that I sort of, you know, I go through this in more detail in early the course where we kind of, and we have our patients do this, right? Where it's like, okay, you know, we have patients that show up, sometimes they're on like a freaking hundred supplements or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like, oh, I think I would have done something on NR. Yeah. So NR and, and, and NMN um, for sure. And, uh, and it's like, you know, I just have them ask like, or answer a series of questions like, okay, why are you taking this? You know, are you taking this because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's something that's going to improve lifespan or health span or both. Like actually try to articulate that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, if so, you know, is it operating through a geroprotective mechanism 
broadly speaking, or is it disease specific? Um, what kind of uh, human data exist on the safety and the efficacy? What kind of animal data exist on the safety and the efficacy? If it's a um, grass formulation, how do you ensure purity? Like, what are the what are the thing? What allows you to ensure purity uh, and stuff like that? So, so you know, I, I think it's very important to go through that type of line of inquiry before you take a molecule. Like, you have to be able to provide some sense of why you're taking it. And, and for some things like it's, you know, you're going to have far less clarity around the answers to those questions for sure. Um, but you have to have some sense of risk reward, I think with everything you take. And I mean, I think too many people have a very loose sense of risk and reward when they're talking about over the counter supplements. They're like, come on, it says if it's, if I can buy it on Amazon, like it's gotta be safe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, that's not actually true at all. Like I've seen people nearly box their livers taking stuff they bought on Amazon. So phosphatidylserine, would that be on your list? Yeah, it might be. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of phosphatidylserine when I travel. I don't know if it was going to make the list, um, but it's a big part of Berberine. my, nah, probably not. I mean, I've got metformin on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So of those top most important, uh, drugs and supplements to understand which of those do you take out of curiosity? Um, right. well, I take things that aren't on there and I take some things that are on there. So, you know, I take bempedoic acid, is that a mybin rapatha? So that's my, Oh, you take all three. Yeah. That's my big stack on cardiovascular. And no statin. No. Okay. Um, there's this website that continuously updates seemingly weekly with what your supposed stack is. And I guess, they are not up to date because they say you're on a statin right now. I mean, I was in the past. What is what does the stack have there? I'm curious. Or what does the uh, what does the website say? <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have read this first, and you could tell me how accurate it was. So it says that currently, as of August 9th, two thousand twenty-three, you <laughs> take two grams of omega three fish oil per day. Vitamin D, you target a forty to sixty nanogram per milliliter blood level, apparently. By the way, why do you not exceed sixty? Um, Calcium. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that it's necessary. Truthfully, I, okay. I haven't seen any evidence that it needs to really be above sixty. Even though I think there's probably no harm in going a little bit higher. Magnesium, multiple types per day, up to one gram total. Is that accurate? No, I take much more than that. Of yield or like full elemental weight. Um, no, a full elemental weight, right? Cause I'm taking four to 500 of mag oxide. Plus I take like two to three slow mag and each of those is probably pushing 60 to 80 milligrams plus the two L3 innates. No, you're right. That's probably a mil That's probably a gram of magnesium. Okay. Yeah. And what do you think about the magnesium RDA of like 400 or whatever it is? I think it's low. I think it's a mistake actually. I think, I think magnesium deficiency, that would be one of the other supplements that's on there is magnesium for sure. I think magnesium deficiency is such an underappreciated low hanging fruit. And modulator of blood pressure to some extent. Yeah. And also just modulator of, you know, especially if you're someone who exercises like performance-based, you know, mitigating, uh, fasciculations, cramping, PVCs. We see a lot of people, young people that show up with PVCs. Um, one and, of the few things that impacts testosterone too. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. You remember the OG, like ZMA pills? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Magnesium in it. All right. What else am I taking? So are you on two grams of fish oil? Uh, no, I take a little more than that. I think. Okay. Probably three. How much of that is EPA and DHA? Um, I think the current, I take Carlson's and I think it's called either elite or super EPA. So it's, a, it's slightly weighted in the favor of EPA. It's probably a 60, 40 EPA split. This clip is going to help this guy with just the most consolidated updated list. Protein powder, apparently you have one shake per day. I'm assuming that's variable depending on, yeah. you know, whatever your appetite is like, if you have time versus not to eat, traveling, et cetera. Um, greens powder, do you have that typically? I do. Oh, yeah. I, I take an AG every single morning. I forgot about that in my morning routine. So that's actually the first thing I ingest is I take AG and I take two probiotics that are also, yeah, um, they're, it's made by a company called Pendulum. Um, it doesn't come like with uh 
like cold packs? Yes. Okay. And they they come, get refrigerated right It's refrigerated right away. right away. And they, this is the only company to my knowledge that is not looking at CFUs to tell you what they have in there. They're actually looking at, um, uh, I think they're, I don't think they're doing gene expression. I think they're actually doing microarrays or protein blots, but they're actually looking at the output of acromanthia. What, what is it called again? They're called Pendulum is the name of the company. Pendulum. Yeah. Probi but no, you know, have you ever heard of symbiotics? Mm -mm. Okay. It's like a combo of pre and probiotic, but I guess you could just get that separately anyways. <clears throat> yeah. So Pendulum, um, Nice. So that there's a there's a probiotic in there called glucose control that um, again it's a super rigorous. I think it's the best compound on the market. Uh, I have no affiliation. I know the CEO though, and then I do have an affiliation with AG, so I should disclose that. So I'm a I'm an investor and advisor to Athletic Greens. Uh, okay. And uh, but I take I take a scoop of AG every morning with my probiotic as my starting thing quick note from sponsor of the channel ag1 also formerly known as athletic greens but now known as ag1 this is the go-to greens formula essentially when i was looking to optimize my greens intake admittedly i'm pretty terrible about eating enough greens what is seen as ideal and if i can get a fractional top up even if it's not a complete replacement or a complete optimization i i'm just so strapped for time at this point i don't want to cook more i don't want to clean more I don't want to go to the grocery store and, you know, spend a bunch of time on this. For me, this is the go-to solution that fits my lifestyle and it may for you as well. When trying to figure out what should I be getting, oftentimes in areas of health, fitness, optimization, it's pretty hard to stay on top of all the literature meticulously. There's so much stuff coming out all the time. So similar to you guys, I will follow certain educators that I trust, respect, deem worthwhile to you know, assimilate their recommendations into my own and kind of make an educated opinion as to what is my overarching individualized, you know, optimal path forward when it comes to nutritional integrations, dietary supplements, what have you, whatever it is. For me, nutritional literature is like not my area of interest, really. So like I said, I will often check out what all of the top names in the space who are on the cutting edge constantly trying to figure out what is the go-to and this appeared to be it by many that I very much trust and respect and find educational value in their material. So for me, it was a no-brainer to go with them and seeing it was updated 52 times too as a formulator myself was something that was confidence inspiring because oftentimes if a formula is crushing it and selling well, it's not necessarily conducive to business to have to go back and alter it and change your labels, especially if you have a very big company having to go back and make changes is not necessarily a easy thing to do. So to do it 52 times since 2010, to me, reflected on their values as a company that they are trying to stay on the up and up and be at the cutting edge, regardless of their stance as like the trusted go-to company. They don't lean on that and just basically hedge on the fact that everyone will trust them blindly regardless. They still continuously iterate, innovate, and that was cool for me to see. So that was why I used it. So if you find yourself in a similar boat to me, trying to optimize for efficiency or simply increase your greens intake or get a top up of sorts of your nutrition, check it out, drinkag1.com slash more plates, more dates. And there is a free special offer applied as well when you go to the site through my link with a free one year supply of vitamin D3 and K2 added in, which is an awesome supplement, something that I would often recommend probably in my top five to 10 supplements for most people. And then also a five free travel packs. So AG1 has these one day single serving greens travel packs. You get five free as well when you do your first purchase. So you can check it out, drinkag1.com slash more plates, more dates, link in the description below and back to our regularly scheduled programming. So this probiotic blend lowers glucose? Yes. Okay. And it's- So acromanthia basically supports the production of butyrate um, uh, and that's kind of how you're getting that metabolic benefit. What do you think of those sodium butyrate supplements that are straight? Um, cause I'm pretty sure you can just buy straight sodium butyrate. Yeah. And I think people are sort of using that for ketone production, aren't they? I think some are using it as like a HDAC inhibitor or something too, or like a gene expression modifier. Apparently it has like some 
effect that I would have to read about to yeah. say exactly what it was. No, I'm not, I'm not really yeah. familiar with its use. All right, sleep supplements taken regularly. Glycine, two grams prior to sleep. Yes. Ashwagandha, 600 milligrams prior to sleep. I actually switched to a purer formulation, and I'm down to a lower dose, 300. So is that like a sensor roll? I, I'm using a Solgar version now. I switched from Jero to Solgar. What's the withanolide content? Oh, it's actually, um, put it this way, going from 600 of Jero to 300 of Solgar increased the concentration. Okay. I want to say, God, I should know this, maybe eight, eight milligrams. Let's see. Ashwagandha extract vegetable. Should say on the bottle, right? Yeah, it is uh, eight point four, four point five milligrams, four point five in one three hundred mg tra- uh, capsule. Yeah, so it's da- one point five percent with analyte content. That's in the Solgar and the Jero. Solgar, okay. I'm glass, a, big. Let me see. Well, you don't have to flip the monitor around, but no, yeah, it's the it's glass. The glass. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Next up, we got magnesium l threonate, which I guess is part of the other yep. combo that you take. Taken occasionally for jet lag to sleep early, melatonin, two to five milligrams. Um, yeah, I never take five. Um, at least not that I, 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 I would take one to three to sleep on a plane. Or, or for just guys lag. getting his information. Or have you said five before? I mean, it's possible. <laughs> that five is a lot because I only have ones and threes. 400 to 600 phosphatidylserine. For jet lag as well. And then that's all he has for jet lag. Do you have anything else in there? now um besides the glycine ashwagandha magnesium yeah i'll take uh typically 50 of trazodone as well okay yep no more fenibut i don't okay yeah. that stuff is pretty uh pretty cool for social anxiety even and like public speaking and stuff oh really yeah but unfortunately it develops tolerance somewhat has pretty significant withdrawals after use and I guess it's been banned. So, that's, yeah, that's, that that that's true. It's no longer grass. Yeah. yeah. Theracumin. So is this like not the combo bio pairing? It's like a different yeah, bioavailable version. This is the pure encapsulations version of theracumin. That's just sort of a kind of a higher potency curcumin. Okay. Gotcha. Now for curcumin, do you take that daily? I do. Okay, you've never found like an anti-androgenic effect or anything? It's possible. Maybe. Does that explain my low T? I don't know. Huberman says it, curcumin wrecked him when he really? took it. Yeah, like noticeably. But he's super sensitive to seemingly everything. He day. is, yeah. 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 Rapamycin for longevity. Still take it? <laughs> I do. Do you, you microdose it? Like a couple? No, I mean, I macrodose it intermittently, right? Yeah, okay. Only taking it once a week. So what is the dose? Sort of curious. I take eight milligrams once a week, and it's presumably important that it's the brand version and not the compounded. It should never be compounded because if it's not enterically coated, it won't leave the stomach. Mm. So all those people compounding it need to stop. But it could—it doesn't have to be branded Rapimune. It could be generic Sirolimus. They both have an enteric coating on them. Okay, statin PCASK9 inhibitor. So I guess it's not the statin anymore. It is the other ones you already mentioned. And anything they're missing? We probably already covered everything, right? Uh, no, I'm sure there's other things on there. I feel like I have another few bottles in my pill thing, but... one. Uh, qu- oh, yeah, the NR. Why not NMN? And why I d- not... I don't take NR. Oh, I you just think it's something NR. to understand. Yeah, I think it's worth talking about NR and NMN, but I don't, I've never taken them and don't. Gotcha. Oh, you've never even thought to experiment after all the questions? Um... People drill you about that stuff. Yeah. No, I just don't find the data compelling. Hmm. Okay. Um, not even NAD IVs? I've never done an NAD IV. Okay. Um, B vitamins, question on that. So in one of your, it might've been an AMA or a podcast, you talk about how to lower homocysteine. You usually give patients one to two pills of a combined methylfolate and activated B12, methylcobalamin um, supplement from Jaro and then B6. Yep. So Jaro has like a normal strength and an extra strength version. Um, extra strength is one to two pills would be 400 to 800 micrograms methylfolate with 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms of activated B12. 
Um, and then ultra strength would make one to two pills, double that in methylfolate, 800 to 1600 micrograms or, and 5,000 to 10,000 of activated B12. What is the, the one you use? I use the regular strength and I just take one regular strength and one B6. But when we are taking care of people who have a really hard time methylating, we will escalate the dose of that and then we'll use TMG as well if we have to. So somebody with a high homocysteine, you would use like what typically dosage wise? Well, again, you you know, you have to make sure you're not chasing your tail, right? So somebody with compromised kidney function is going to have a high homocysteine regardless. You're not going to be able to fix it. So you have to sort of live with what you've got. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but but it would be pretty unusual that you would push two extra strength. Yeah, I think one extra strength plus B six. If you're not there yet, you move to uh, TMG. So with B six. Do you, 50 milligrams. And is it the activated or inactive? You can usually just get away with the regular uh, act. You don't, it doesn't need to be activated. Have you seen the literature that shows supplementation with high concentrations of pyridoxine HCL leads to decreased B6 function? It's yes. Safe. Yeah. But 50 milligrams is such a high dose that you're kind of overcoming that. Okay. So it's like, you don't think it would be better to use the, like, it seems like the higher it is, the more you're inhibiting action, like yeah. almost like an anti-androgen. You know, there's sorts. another guy in our practice that really is kind of the guy on this. And, and we, I remember we talked about this a couple of years ago and the answer came back that at the doses we were using, it's we were okay. The, you know, that said though, it's funny, bring this up. We are revisiting this now because every year, um, we, we look at um, uh, like, what's it called? Like a third party that does testing on purity. Mm -hmm. So actually that's kind of why we switched on the um, ashwagandha. Okay. Based on that analysis. And um, so, so we might revisit this entire thing on the B vitamins. Yeah, like conclusion of this study, the present study indicates that neuropathy observed after taking a relatively high dose of B6 supplements was due to pyridoxine. Inactive form competitively inhibits the active P5P. Consequently, symptoms of B6 supplementation are similar to those of B6 deficiency. So that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, let me, if you can send me that, I'd like to take a look at it. Yeah, sure. Um, the, so those patients at baseline had neuropathies or they had neuropathy induced? Since 2014, greater than 50 cases of sensory neuronal pain due to B6 supplementation were reported. So Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've never seen this, but it's worth noting. Um, shit, I have so <laughs> Traverse trial. Let me just, you know, get this fired off quick. And <laughs> uh, um, what is your takeaway from it? Because they use androgel. Yeah, I mean, I think the... I think that's the first issue with that study is you know I just think androgel is just a garbage product. I don't I understand <laughs> yeah. why it exists, but it yeah. really shouldn't. And I think anybody who wants to get serious about TRT uh, should should sort of abandon androgel and and opt for an injectable compound uh, or even pellets, frankly, although they have their issues with their physiologic spikes and such. So I think that's part of the problem. I think the second thing is. You know, I don't think the trial was necessarily long enough, um, and I'm not convinced that they got the testosterone high enough in the treatment group. Now, obviously, for what the study was doing, they accomplished their goal, right? The goal of the study was to demonstrate cardiovascular safety, and it it did that. It found uh, no increase in cardiovascular events in the testosterone group. But if you're going to play devil's advocate, you could argue, well, maybe they didn't find it because they didn't wait long enough and or they didn't get high enough. I think the Long enough probably wouldn't be an issue because if you look at the other literature on testosterone, usually the people who are going to have a cardiovascular event on T, it's going to happen sooner uh, than later. So, you know, I, I think that a year, you're, if you have a high enough risk population, you're going to see increased CV events in a large enough trial. But I would have, I like, I'd like to see a trial where they move the T to a higher level with an injectable form. And um, obviously, it's not like a vitamin D trial where you pick a number because you're also managing the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, I would say <clears throat> the the finding that I was probably most surprised by was the slight increase in fractures. Um, 
it's possible. So A, that was just surprising on the surface. Don't know what to make of it, truthfully. It kind of flies in contrast to other literature. It's also possible, based on this population, that those patients were more active. Mm -hmm. So you basically got people feeling a lot better. They became more active, and that's where you saw that small increase of fracture. Um, I guess I said there was one thing that surprised me. The other thing that surprised me was that there was no reduction in diabetes. It was a wash. Mm. And based on the JAMA paper from two years ago that showed, I can't remember if it was JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, but that paper two years ago that showed a significant reduction in insulin resistance in non-diabetics on testosterone, which I think became an expansion in the use case for TRT beyond the usual symptoms. I think insulin resistance is, is an indication in addition to hypogonadism coupled with the other symptoms that this study didn't see any improvement in diabetes was a little surprising. But again, you know, if you're not taking the right dose in the right form, it's certainly possible that you're just missing an effect that could be there. What, what were your thoughts? Um, yeah, like it was hard for me to really say conclusively that I'm thrilled with seeing a total T go from two something to 450 and then trying to make conclusions based off that, um, especially with a format that almost nobody we are talking to or see or anything would you know be even using it probably yeah um it seemed like there was some you know hematology differences that were at least of note um what was the difference in hematocrit off the top of my head i just remembered the pe's there was like twice as many it wasn't mm -hmm. a significant like a ton <clears throat> of them but it was there was more mm -hmm. and i think it was double the amount and there's 13 and the control and then i think there was 23 26 in the androgel wow. group or something i don't know so it was uh to me just you know at least highlighted it's worthwhile to evaluate closely and not just assume the headline of the articles that were being put out like testosterone safe and kind of inferring just like use it at will without really overseeing even the markers like you're just good to go so at least that was I, i'd like to see a bigger trial and w is there is there more follow-up coming from the traverse trial i don't know i was uh i thought you would have a better answer to that no me. i i i i i knew this at one point and i've kind of forgotten but okay. but I, I i know people who were involved in that trial and i i can kind of reach out to them um okay and see if that was it or if there's a another round of um a, another round of insights yeah, it was, uh, let's see, no increase in cardiovascular death, heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, but twice as many pulmonary embolisms. And then I was I was going to ask you, is hypercoagulability a concern on therapeutic replacement? Yeah, I mean, it would certainly seem like it from the PE increase. Mm. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's necessarily like unexpected to think that something that increases erythropoiesis and such. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm asking. Do they, do they show what the increase is in hemoglobin in that group? I'd have to pull it up. Oh, it's all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. But, but yeah, like I imagine if you castrate somebody and he's hype, you know, has barely any androgens, you would expect that things are going to be lower. And I don't think that's reflective of good necessarily yep. either. So, um, context dependent, I guess. But, um, as far as format of test, presumably you're all about injections at a frequency that makes sense. And yeah. We, we, we have our patients inject, um, we, we, we ask twice a week, you know, we sort of uh, think that that's probably the sweet spot. Um, some people do a little bit more intermittently. We'll have people that only want to do it. Have you ever heard of the scrotal cream application method? No. It actually seems to disproportionately spike DHT from the localized 5AR activity, which is interesting. So it's mm. really a nuisance because you have to wipe this stuff on your scrotum twice a day which is a huge pain in I the I mean, mouth. if androgel uh, compliance is low, this yeah. is this has got to be lower. Yeah, but it actually achieves like pretty good numbers and the disproportionate- Testosterone as well? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because at least in my case, the surface area is not that large, so- Yeah, well, these people are slathering it on, so <laughs> yeah. It's super unattractive. It's like the least unattractive method probably. Like, at least androgel, you're just wiping on your arm or something, not like- <laughs> yeah. yeah brutal so you mentioned that you in the sauna for example will listen to podcasts is there any like what do you watch or listen to on for content out of curiosity um well you know it's hard because um i sort of 
I can't, there, I, there's, uh, there's too many things that I want to listen to and not mm. enough time. So, and usually by the way, in the sauna, I'm listening to music cause it's okay. just me and my wife. Yeah. Only when I'm in the sauna by myself, do I listen to a podcast or audio book. Mm. But if, if I'm in there with her, she doesn't want to listen at 1.5 or 1.6 speed. Oh, that's how fast you listen. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, so, so, so the other night I was in there by myself and I was listening to an audio book, but, um, but most of the time we're listening to music. So most of my podcast book is done on bike. So that gives me like four hours a week of zone two to, to consume, which is not that much time, even at one and a half speed. Okay. So I, I, I there's no person out there for whom I can listen to everything they're doing. Cause oh, I, just, yeah. I just can't. Right. So, yeah. so basically I just sift through a handful of things that I really enjoy and, um, you know, I don't know how to describe it. Categorically, other. maybe. Like no, what? that's the thing. It's like, it's across, like, I mean. F1, archery. Yeah, I li exactly. Like, I'll, I'll listen to, you know, my buddy John Dudley. He's got an archery podcast. I, I listen to F1 podcasts. I listen to political podcasts. I listen to, obviously, some health-related stuff. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there is not, um, you know, Club Random I really love with Bill Maher. Um, you know, honestly with Barry Weiss, I mean, there's just, there's just a lot of stuff that I like. Um, and then there's other stuff that I consume more on YouTube. Like I kind of, I don't listen to you at all. I watch you on YouTube. Okay. Um, yeah, I was curious how you even found me to begin with. Cause, um, I think YouTube, right. I think yeah. just, just probably I was like, oh, it was like at complete random recommended on the sidebar or something sort of thing. No, I think I was probably like searching some topic and, and uh. something came up. I, I, I don't, I honestly, I don't recall. So SEO is important. Must be. On YouTube. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah. And then as far as like just kind of, you know, I love watching F1. That's probably the only sport I keep up with. So I, I watch everything to do with F1. And that's been that way for a very long time. So that means I'm, you know, I usually am not watching practice truthfully. So the structure of an F1 weekend is – Usually have a free practice one on Friday, free practice two on Friday, free practice three Saturday, qualifying Saturday, race Sunday, or on a sprint weekend, it's free practice one Saturday, qualifying, oh, sorry, free practice one on Friday, qualifying Friday afternoon, and then a uh, shootout quali on Saturday, mm -hmm. sprint race afterwards on Saturday, and then race on Sunday. So depending on which format of the weekend I'm watching everything except FP one typically. Um, and what do you think of, uh, Alpha Tori's, uh, new, new name, Hugo boss balls. balls. I love it. I love it. It's just so good. <laughs> so I saw probably one of the favorite things I tweeted, uh, I retweeted it was like a video of a whole bunch of drivers faces. And, and it was of course their faces in response to something, but it was yeah. like everybody's face in response to the name. It's so good. <laughs> Dan Danny Ricardo's face in that video oh, yeah. is insane gold. Are you a Ricardo fan? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've only met Danny once. Um, so I don't, I don't know him, but, but I, I, I like him a lot and I think everybody's really happy to see him back in, in, in F1. Yeah. Do you, what do you think is the future for him? Um, cause it's tough when like, could you foresee that he would ever take Sergio's seat or sure. Oh, absolutely. Look, Red Bull's ruthless. And if, if Sergio doesn't perform, mm -hmm. uh, they, they bring Daniel up in a heartbeat. Um, because again, like t the number two driver in on any team has a very specific niche to play. Do you think he would be the likely candidate to replace though, or do you think they would seek talent in another, or try and poach another team or something? It's hard to say, but look, if Daniel drives well, and it's, it's sort of difficult to evaluate what that means with Alpha Tauri this year, because mm -hmm. their car is so bad this year, yeah. which is very unusual given that it's the sister team of Red Bull, right? Mm -hmm. So they should be able to draft a lot off yeah. Red Bull's technology. And yeah, that's the weird thing that I have a hard time grasping sometimes is A, how does an energy drink company end up beating everyone in terms of car performance and function? And then like obviously they don't literally build it themselves, but I mean still 
they had to coordinate getting it done. And then why would the sister team not have something at least within striking distance? Yeah. Well, again, it's, it's, it's not uncommon that it wouldn't be, you know, nearly as good. I mean, just as, you know, Alfa Romeo is never going to be as good as Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, this year is a bit surprising at how poor they're doing. And that makes it difficult, I think, to evaluate Danny's performance. But if you, you know, assuming Danny drives well and has some, has some good drives this year, um, you know, I, I think he, look, he, as long as, you know, Daniel would be okay being the number two, because remember Daniel kind of left because it, he didn't want to be the number two. I can't help but think now he would be okay with it. Yeah. I mean, look, I think Max has established himself as the greatest driver in the world and, you know, Max's domination is really only going to be limited by, I think his desire to drive in formula one um, obviously pending the next rule change. Cause obviously every time there's a, a reg change, it, it mixes the order up a little bit, mm. but I don't think anybody, certainly I did not expect Red Bull to be this dominant in 2022, which was the last big reg change. So, um, in some ways that's almost making it hard for people to appreciate how good Max Verstappen is because, I think people just kind of look at Max and think, well, he's got the best team. And it's like, yeah, but he won his first championship without the best car. Yeah. Right. So, you know, Mercedes had the best car in 2021 and Max still won. Yeah. Um, and Max was winning races when Red Bull did not have a competitive car. Um, it wasn't a bad car, but it wasn't, you yeah. know, it wasn't, it was, you know, third or fourth best car. So, yeah. I, uh, to your question, look, I mean, Red Bull, um, you know, keep in mind, like Red Bull didn't start from scratch, right? Like they bought Jaguar. Mm. Right. So they bought a previous F1 team. What's most amazing about that, and that was in 04 or 05, what's most amazing is within one year, they had produced a better result than Jaguar had in the entire time that Jaguar owned the F1 team. Yeah. That's what's amazing. Yeah. And that speaks to the culture, right? Mm. Which was, you know, it really comes down to Dietrich and to, Christian Horner and, you know, really that, you know, that team was sort of, you know, really, really, really good people who knew racing very, very well. And the other advantage Red Bull has over all the other teams is it's a private company. Um, and, or at least it was at the time, I think it's still a private company. Um, one decision maker. Right. So the founder of Red Bull basically is making all the decisions. So for example, like one of the most important decisions they made early on was to bring a guy named Adrian Newey over from McLaren, mm -hmm. um, or from Williams. I'm sorry. So I think, wait, he, I think he was coming from Williams at the time. I'd have to go back and look, but anyway, um, or maybe he was back at McLaren. I don't recall, but the point is like, the cost of bringing him over was enormous, something to the tune of like 20,000 pounds. Um, and it was a decision that was made instantly. Like this is the best aerodynamicist in the world. Like we're going to bring him over. You say how many pounds? 20 million. Did I say 20,000? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's like, like, uh, like, that it's like Dr. Evil. Yeah. <laughs> no. One million dollars. No, it was 20 million pounds was, okay. was, was what it cost to bring Adrian Newey over. And they were just like, yep, we'll do it. So it's like, you know, big budget, big balls and you know no committee no deci no no decision making by committee do you compete in the sim racing against any of the guys in f1 or is it more just like pure enjoyment, no i mean you know no i i, I don't for me it's just pure training question no, no 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 it's yeah. not i mean like you know i racing which is what i drive is uh there's a huge competitive um component to it i, I use it for training i mean i'm really in there trying to as closely as possible, treat it like I would treat a street car, mm -hmm. um, and replicate a driving style that I would drive in a street car or in a track car on a track. And, you know, it's just a great, it's also just a great platform for, for coaching. So like I can, you can work virtually with a coach. So I work, you know, my coach is in California and we're, we're doing sim sessions together. So the, the learning curve with the simulators, you know, you couldn't, it would be hard to imagine being kind of a normal guy like me who doesn't have the ability to be on the track every day mm -hmm. getting better without a simulator. All right. How 
is this sim like some of the best guys don't use the simulator at all right and they just get by on pure experience and well it's keep it's important to keep in mind like you know any everybody in f1 today grew up karting so yeah. they learned feel in a go-kart yeah and some guys continue to sim a lot obviously no one sims more than max verstappen so max max is i think I think basically Max Verstappen, Michael Schumacher, and Ayrton Senna live in a rarefied capacity of like, there is no greater driving talent than those three. And also those three, you know, just have clearly a competitiveness that I think has never been rivaled. And in the case of Max, like it goes to a whole other level, just his obsession with driving, like all Max does is drive. Like Max, what are your hobbies? Driving. Okay, right. But when you're not driving, what are you doing? Driving. Like, you know, in between races, when all the other guys are like partying, what's Max doing? He's driving. He's literally, he'll, he'll drive anything. Like he'll get into like, you know, an M3 and just, you know, drive like GT class or be in the simulator where he's racing. I mean, he's one of the best drivers in sim racing as well. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, it's partly why I asked. I wasn't sure how impactful it is or if, you know. It's different. It's, it's very different. You like, can I've be, heard, you can be could, really, like, really good. Your motor well, I mean, almost. I think it's funny. Like, I don't think Max would ever drive an F1 car in iRacing. Because ah. I think that would be potentially too much of a screw up for, you know, what he's used to. That said, the F1 simulators, the drivers themselves do have simulators and different drivers have different points of view on how much they like to use it. Um, you know, there are certain things that simulators still can't replicate perfectly. And the most important of those is yaw, mm -hmm. which is the, um, this degree, this, this axis of movement, right? So the yaw is what you're feeling when a car oversteers. Oversteers is when the rear of the car starts to turn at an angle faster than the front of the car. So when the rear of a car snaps out behind you, your eyes are the last thing to figure that out. Mm. So your butt, your ears and your hands should figure that out first and then your eyes are last. But I really think, I really think, you know, for me, the butt is the most sensitive. And so to not have that in a simulator is, you know, it's a challenge. How do you get into F1? Cause it's, you know, obviously even me admittedly got into it through drive to survive. Right. You've been like hardcore for a while. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I think, you know, growing up, I enjoyed F1. I enjoyed IndyCar a lot. That was very popular in Toronto when I was growing up. You know, Canada had some pretty good drivers. Um, and um, and then, you know, I really stopped paying attention after. So, so Jacques Villeneuve won the world championship in 1997. That was kind of the last year I paid attention for quite a while. It wasn't really again until Sebastian Vettel's era in the early 2010s that I got back into it. So I, I took a total hiatus from all sports. Like I didn't, when I was in med school and residency, like I didn't really pay attention to much of anything in life. Mm. Uh, I mean, meaning outside of like what I was working on. So it was really nice to come back to it. And, um, you know, I, I and I've, and the good news is like, I've got a great group of friends who are equally passionate about it who have been forever right so you know old school guys who have just as much of an appreciation for you know senna as they do for you know the modern driver so when are you gonna get a senna for the garage <laughs> that's gotta be on your radar at some point yeah like, yeah for sure list. no i think a senna would be would be a, a great a great uh, track car um yeah, they're they're pretty special cars. Hmm. Well, I did uh, bring a little something as a you know token of my gratitude. I thought I might appreciate it or might not. I might be way off, but I found this piece of memorabilia that I thought you might like. It is a uh, oh wow! Limited. This is every one of Senna's cars. Yeah, so it's a uh, the Ayrton Senna Foundation pin collection and supposedly limited edition only a thousand of them available and it's this just, is gorgeous it's just thank like you a, so much yeah Derek, thought, this is awesome yeah no worries I'll, uh, I'll, i was like does he he probably already has this or i actually wouldn't. don't i don't have this and you would be amazed i will show you my memorabilia later i was I, watching I, one of your uh 
I was trying to see if I could find a wider angle of your Facebook videos because that's where you have all your stuff behind you. And I was looking if you had anything hanging on the walls or anything. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't see anything similar, so I thought it was uh, worth uh, uh, this is, bringing. This is, this is very, very cool. Obviously, sadly, they do include uh, the 11th car, right? So he really only raced for 10 seasons, 84 through 93, and then he died three races into the 94 season in the Williams FW16, mm. which they do have there at the bottom. Maybe you could pull it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have a model of uh, three of his cars there, okay. uh, including the FW16. Um, so I have his last race, um, his first win, and his first title cool. up there. So that's awesome. Well, oh, yeah. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's been amazing. And, uh, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of all your stuff. I'll continue to consume the content on the drive, educating myself. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having me and, um, look forward to seeing you at F1 this year as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. All right. You ready to go for a ruck? Yeah, let's do it. All right.